Good morning and welcome to our weekly broadcast. If this is the first time you're joining us, welcome. If you're joining us for the 20th or 21st time, welcome back. So the way it works is you write down all of your questions and you write it down right beside the YouTube video there. Sorry, it's a little bit dark here. Um, and then once I've answered all questions, the call is over, but I will stay on this call longer than anybody so I can humbly answer all questions that you might have. Now, the record we've had is five and a half hours so far. Uh, let's see if we can beat that this week. Um, I'm here for you. And so here's my uh, my setup, lights, camera, a little bit of action maybe. So anyway, please write down your questions uh, and uh, let's begin. Thank you. Good morning, hope all is well. Uh, sorry we started a minute late there. We blew a fuse in the house, there's a, a big storm here. Uh, all the lights went out here, so I had to throw one light in the side. Hopefully the lighting works for you. Um, unprofessional, I apologize. So um, let, let's get started. Um, I, I wanna make sure that uh, everything is working here. So Wrigley, uh, please give me a, a call uh, and let me know if there's any issues at all. I'm gonna jump right into it now. Uh, so if this is your first time on the call, uh, welcome. Uh, if, if you have questions, please type your questions right now. And I promise you the, uh, the, the call will never, ever end uh, until I've answered all questions. So let me just uh, clear this up here. Give me one second to, to get started so it's a better resolution. Uh, I apologize. Um, technical issues this morning with, uh, with, with the big storm. So hold on one second. There we go. Okay, Wrigley's saying there's a, there's a lot of echo. All right, I, I apologize for that. Uh, give, give me one second. Um, I wanna see if I can turn off. Um, how's that, Wrigley, is that, is that better? Please stay with us and please just type your, your questions uh, and we'll get started um, uh, right away. Thank you. Okay. All right, so Wrigley, get back to me if, if the echo is still there, uh, thank you. Um, and again, just enter your questions. Uh, and then once um, uh, once there's no more questions on the call, then I'll wrap the call up again. I apologize for starting a minute late and that the lighting just disaster here. All right, um, so here I go. Uh, got a question here. First time here, how does it work? What do you talk about? Well, thank you, welcome. So um, I, I answer every question you ask. Um, it can be business, personal, uh, it can be career related or anything at all. It's AMA, ask me anything. And I'll give you my, my humble thoughts. Um, thank you. Okay, it looks like the echo is fine now. Thanks again. Sorry, let's let's get to this. All right, next, next question is from uh, uh, Ghost to Ghost. Uh, welcome. Uh, hi, Chris. Uh, I'm in different courses with you at Udemy. How can I have you officially as my mentor? But thank you for that. I, I appreciate it. And, and all my, my students inspire me so much. Uh, and I love when I, get, when I get that question. The best way is just to come on this call every week uh, or whenever you can and ask me as many questions as you want to. And I'm humbly happy to, to give you my thoughts on, um, on, on everything. Thank you for that. Wrigley, let me know if the lighting is okay as well. I know the sound is fine too. Okay, next question here. Thank you. Um, hi, Chris. I, I see you mentioned uh, Nassim Taleb, Taleb's uh, Fooled by Randomness book a few times uh, in previous webcasts. Yeah, and it's actually right beside me right now, right here. Um, can I ask what's the biggest lesson relevant to investing that, that you've learned? Thanks. Um, yeah, so I, I think that you got to be longer term focused. Um, that's that's the, uh, the best way to make money longer term. Stay with me here. I'm going to open the door, please. One second. Thanks. Okay, I got a backup generator. I didn't want this to happen again, but what can you do? Uh, so I think thinking longer term is the best way to invest always. Um, if, if you're short term focused, you get fooled by randomness, which is the title of that book. Uh, and there's a reason why you never hear of very successful traders that are relevant in the long run. They might have a good month, a good year, whatever, but in the long run, 
um, they usually look for another job uh, or transfer within a big bank to another division, I should say. So if you're fooled by randomness and you're short-term focused, you'll never make money. And I promise you this as well. And so you might ask, well, Chris, why do a lot of hedge funds make money? Well, a lot of them don't. Some of the great ones make money, um, especially the ones that are three to five year focused and they're called Tiger Cubs. Um, Julian Robertson started a company called Tiger, a great hedge fund uh, back in the 80s and he's long-term focused. Um, some hedge funds do well because they cheat. That's right, they cheat. And, and I have a, a lecture if you wanna watch it uh, on insider information. Just go to my vlog and search for insider information uh, and you'll see. But when I invest, I love to look at three things in this order. Number one, fundamentals, right? Number two, valuation. And then a distant third is, is technical analysis, which helps me just decide when to buy or not buy a stock, that sort of thing. All right, next, next question here. All right, so Carg's uh, uh, got a question. What are non-banking financial institutions? Okay, so uh, in, an insurance company uh, could be thought of that, um, as well as um, um, you know, a hedge fund, uh, a venture capital firm, that sort of thing. So when people say non-banking, uh, what, what they're referring to is either one of two things, a big finance company that doesn't have a bank, right? Or a big finance company that doesn't have an investment bank. Uh, and so the large conglomerates globally, like JP Morgan, Barclays, et cetera, they have many different divisions. And so they are a banking financial uh, services company. The non-banking ones are the ones that focus on something where you and I cannot go to the bank and deposit or withdraw money, hedge funds, venture capital firms, et cetera. Thank you. All right, next question is, um, I, I, have a, I have a dream. I love that, just to start. Um, I have a dream to make a media project meaning a TV channel or digital form for edu for entertainment uh, and awareness. And I need to know if it's possible to make this idea come true and what do I need to work out? Yeah, absolutely. You know, th the amazing thing is that if you embrace YouTube, uh, and YouTube is actually the uh, second biggest uh, search engine in the world, but if you embrace YouTube and you publish your videos online, it costs you next to nothing. You know, everybody's got a cell phone. Everybody can disrupt uh, or put out a business, large media companies, uh, by vlogging. And I know it sounds crazy, uh, but this is the, the, the first gold rush in history, meaning vlogging, or I should say YouTubing, the first gold rush in history where it doesn't cost you very much money to get started, if anything. And you can make a fortune as well if you're longer term focused. And Every video that you make on YouTube, I, I love to think of them like franchises. And I'm very long-term focused. And at Goldman Sachs, we used to say long-term greedy. And so each video I make is like a franchise. And I know that each one of those franchises will make money longer term. It's not why I do it only. I love doing it as well. And I love engaging with, with students. And so, and, and I encourage, uh, Carter, not just you, but everybody on this call. And all my calls are always generic on this call. But I encourage all of you to start YouTubing. Uh, and one of my students who I met on this weekly call named Sasha Stevenson, uh, Sasha and I are actually making a YouTube course right now. We're going to put out a bunch of them this year uh, so that we'll help you work smarter and not harder when you start vlogging or creating videos for any reason online. It's really, really easy to do, though. It, it's, it's the only gold rush where there's no barriers to entry. Most people have a cell phone and that's all you need. Okay. And if you have a follow-up question on that, please let me know. Uh, but I think we're going to look back years from now and say that uh, this was the best gold rush in history, putting content on YouTube, that is. And the amazing thing is that it's, it's not just about, you know, happy-go-lucky people like Logan Paul or whatever all these other people are uh, putting their, their, their content online and, and, you know, making you happy or, or whatever, or getting your attention with, with a bright image. It's also about um, sharing information with each other and making the world a better place. And there's so many business models, there's so many people online that do this. And there's a guy named Ninja, for all of you Fortnite players out there that makes millions of dollars every year just streaming his video game, uh, uh, on, video games online, right? Uh, and uh, I can't believe I'm forgetting what the name is, uh, Fortnite, that's right, Fortnite. My kids play it a lot. Um, you can make a fortune doing that. And I think that MLG or Major League Gaming is going to be a bigger industry uh, and people will make more money in MLG or Major League Gaming than all major athletes because 
you've got access to 7 billion people immediately by streaming online. Okay, and so it's, it's not just about one or two people that want to vlog daily. Uh, it's about anybody that wants to make a fortune and a living online. Anybody can do it. If I can humbly help you do it, uh, please let me know. I'm getting better at it. I'm, I'm not perfect, please. I've, I've, I've made a ton of mistakes. And when I make courses, my, my goal is to allow you to work smarter, not harder, so that you can be successful without making the many mistakes I've made. Okay. All right, next next question. Um, I've got, um, and Abdallah, if that didn't answer your question, uh, please let me know on, on the TV channel or digital forum. But there's no reason why you can't be the next John Oliver, you know, that that uh, that guy that's on HBO that says, welcome, 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 uh, with, with a desk and a simplistic setup like this. And it's not that hard to do. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you my, uh, my, my, my green, 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 green room here. Uh, this here is filter paper from the light that I had to throw up last minute emergency. Maybe I'll, I'll face it so I don't look so dissonant. Uh, but but anybody can can do this, right? And and what you can do actually is um, I, I'm going to throw on top of this um, this media setup here, this desk, uh, as well as this one here. And anybody can do it. And my vision with this green screen I've got behind me uh, is to make uh, an unbelievable business school. Uh, that takes on Harvard Business School as well as CNBC. It's going to be edutaining. And I've got multiple cameras set up. Um, I've got a desk uh, like this here you see virtually. I've got ones that look actually real. Um, and then what I'm going to do is um, uh, I've, I've got a very wide-angle lens, massive fisheye lens. Uh, it's a, it's a Canon, Canon cinema lens. And when people walk around on television and they tell you about the sports news or the weather, whatever it is, they're not inside a real studio with, with real furniture, I should say. They're in a green screen studio. So uh, let me get uh, back off of this here um, and um, I, I will get back to, to Bigger Chris and, and, and reading your, your, your questions. There we go. Hold on one sec. I'm so sorry. Hold on a sec. All right. I'm, I'm having one of those days, but that's okay. There we go. Well, there we go. That looks like a twilight a little bit in the background, right? All right, next question I've got uh, is from uh, Calipita. Hello, Chris. Tell us something about your favorite music bands, uh, music bands beside uh, U2. Yeah, I'm, I'm wearing my, my NASA uh, shirt uh, th this week. Um, so I, I love musicians that have, um, that have a lot of depth to their music. Uh, and it, maybe it's somewhat poetry focused, but don't turn this webcast off yet. Let me, let me explain what I mean. I like Sting a lot because Sting actually... Uh, there's there's deep meaning to a lot of his lyrics and and I love the police growing up uh, rock band I'm dating myself there big time I should wear a police shirt next week I have a synchronicity when I wear sometimes and what happened was Sting got older and he created these amazing albums with with beautiful poetry in it so I like songs with meanings I I like Pink Floyd a lot as well because there's deep meaning uh, and just chilled music I, I just love it I love it um, you know you set the soundtrack for your own life that's what music is to me um, and, and I listen to a lot of soundtracks too. Like I listen to the Interstellar soundtrack a lot. Hans Zimmer is amazing. Germany, anybody from Germany on the call here? Thank you for Hans Zimmer. Hans Zimmer made the soundtrack for Inception as well. And so what I'll do sometimes is when I'm sitting by myself working or doing whatever it is I'm doing, if I'm not in a peak mental state, I'll ask Siri, and I unplugged Siri this week, so she's not going to talk this week, I promise. But I'll ask Siri to play the soundtrack for whatever movie that I love that gets me into that peak mental state. And the one I've been listening to lately is a soundtrack for the movie Truman, The Truman Show uh, with, uh, with Jim Carrey, which was such a brilliant movie and, and ahead of its time. I mean, they kind of forecasted uh, the sinister side of vlogging, for example, many years in the future. Not bad for a film come, that came out uh, 21 years ago, 1998. Okay, uh, aside from that, I, I like Mumford and Sons. Um, oh, I like their music, they're, they're great, they're great. All right, but I love the Beatles too. I know every every single song from the Beatles really well. I, if you see my other courses, you see me pick up Abbey Road and show you the depth and breadth that the Beatles had to making Abbey Road and the the whole conspiracy theory of Paul McCartney is dead on the album. It's brilliant. If you get a chance, look at it. Okay, look at a graphic of the cover of Abbey Road, one of the best albums in history. It's amazing. You've got four Beatles crossing the road at Abbey Road Studio, uh, where where they're, where they're based. And so the amazing thing about that is that you see in that cover, uh, Paul McCartney 
is in bare feet with a cigarette. And that's symbolizing that, that he's passed away. And the other three members of the Beatles are not uh, wearing, uh, they're all wearing shoes. Uh, John Lennon's at the front. He's the, the priest, um, the rock near a funeral. Uh, then you've got uh, Ringo Starr, uh, who's the Paul Bear, the guy that carries the coffin. Uh, and then you've got uh, George Harrison, who's the grave digger. And if you look really, really closely at, there's a, a, a Volkswagen Beetle car uh, on the left side there. Uh, if you look at the license plate, it says 28 if. And that means if Paul McCartney were alive, he would be 28. Of course, it's he is alive still. It just shows you how brilliant the Beatles were uh, when it came to marketing and controversy too. You know, marketing is, is important. All right, uh, next up, um, I've got a question. Oh, Cardick. Okay, last week you asked me to, to me email me up to set up a call, uh, but I got too afraid uh, and could not email you. Uh, dude, do it today, please. Uh, and and, and I, I rarely do this. I, I did this with Yash a couple weeks ago, and, and, and Yash is, is kicking ass now. Yash, I hope you're on the call, buddy. But just send me an email, and we'll, we'll set up that call, okay? Thank you. And I gave you my email address last week. Thanks. All right. All right, next question um, I've got is, what's the major difference in analyzing banks' financial statements versus non-bank statements? Okay. <clears throat> okay, so... When you analyze different sectors, you look for different drivers. Every single sector that you invest in in the world has one or two things that makes the stock and the financial model work well or not. With retail companies like McDonald's, it's same store sales. You know, how much are, is revenue increasing per store per year? With the hotel industry, it's called RevPAR, which is revenue, revenue per available room. Uh, with commodities companies, obviously it's, it's the price of commodities. When it comes to banks, banks are very, very difficult to analyze. And what makes their financial statements different is a lot of times they actually do investments. And so you have to look at how much debt they have on their books uh, and equity, meaning investments in stocks and other financial instruments. And you also have to go into the annual report, which is called the 10K in the United States. And you can go to sec.gov to get the annual reports for all companies and look up the ticker for city. C for, is for city, okay? And enter that in on sec.gov. And if you drill down, you will find a lot of debt on that balance sheet, okay? A lot more debt probably than other firms have outside of that sector. You can also look in the 10K to see if there's off balance sheet stuff that's been highlighted, uh, meaning other debt instruments, et cetera. So banks are very, very complicated uh, when it comes to investing. And it's one of the reasons that General Electric uh, wanted to spin off its financial services division because it really confused investors that were doing the financial model on GE. Last thing I'll say about that is I remember back in 2008, um, I was short General Electric, meaning I bet it was going to go down in my hedge fund because GE had a massive financial services division. And we woke up one day and we realized, oh my goodness, GE is a bank. Okay. Hopefully that answers your question. If it doesn't, please let me know. Okay. Thank you. Uh, next, next question here. Um, I've got, uh, uh, from Kevin, Kevin, how are you? Uh, the world economic conference is this weekend. Do you think cryptocurrency will be at the top of the agenda for discussion? And what do you think about, uh, Mimble Wimble in cryptocurrency? So I've never heard of, of Mimble Wimble, but I, I think that it will be one of the topics that the world bank, uh, members discuss certainly, uh, because I think the future of money, uh, is digital. And if you think about it, um, uh, Paper money, which people call fiat currency as well, paper money or fiat currency hasn't really changed in like a hundred years. Like the U.S. dollar we use today looks almost identical to the U.S. dollar that we used, you know, about a hundred years ago. Almost identical. It's amazing. And what happens is currencies. I'm not just beating up the United States currency here. I'm, I'm speaking for all currencies globally. Currencies usually have a monopoly, right? There's only one major currency usually in most economies. And monopolies usually don't innovate very much, right? There's no incentive for them to innovate. And so cryptocurrencies kind of creates that moral hazard or that incentive for big governments to innovate their currencies and make it more digital oriented. So yes, I think that at the World Bank Economic Forum, cryptocurrency will be a top discussion, not the biggest one, but it will be big. And I, I say it's not the biggest one because although I made a course called the Complete Cryptocurrency Course uh, and I thoroughly analyzed cryptocurrencies, 
I think a lot of cryptocurrencies are scams. I think 95% are scams, actually. I mean, there's a handful of ones that, that I think are great longer term, like the big early movers. Uh, Bitcoin, I own some of that. Uh, Ether, Ethereum, I, I own that as well. But I think most are scams. I mean, right now, there are more cryptocurrencies out there than there are real paper-based currencies. Think about that. That's a bubble. That's a bubble. And, and there are some great cryptocurrencies out there, but I really do believe that, that most are a scam. And I'm so sorry, I, I don't know anything about uh, Mimblewimble, uh, the cryptocurrency at all. Uh, and there's tons of cryptos I haven't heard of. Um, I, I apologize. Just there's, I can't keep up. I can't keep up. Thank you, though. All right, next question. Let me just have a, a bit of coffee. All right. Next question is, to be honest, I didn't know you, Chris. I came here via Udemy, but I appreciate your live stream. Uh, think I will join it uh, now. Thank you. Uh, how many times are you online? Uh, um, Chris, what do you work on? Uh, greetings from Germany. Thank you. Uh, and earlier, I mentioned Hans Zimmer, uh, the, the best composer ever with the Interstellar soundtrack. Uh, and, uh, and I want to say thank you, Germany, for, for Hans Zimmer. <laughs> so I do this call every week. You can go to my YouTube vlog and you'll see a replay of the call. And what Wrigley does, who works with me, Wrigley's the best, love you, Wrigley. Uh, Wrigley does a, a, a recap of every question, and you just click on the time number and the question name, and you'll see it in the description field of every past webcast I've done. We're on week 22 now. It takes about a day for all that stuff to get written up. I also have a daily vlog. Would love to see you uh, subscribe to that too, if, if, if you want to, if you want to. Thank you and welcome, and, and I hope you join us again. Okay. Uh, next question is from Cardic saying, do I like the Insight Timer app? And so Cardic last week gave me uh, an app which uh, helps me to meditate, which is something I haven't really done. I am so sorry. Guilty as charged. I haven't even opened it yet. I've been so incredibly busy uh, creating my um, this, this new MBA program online and, and a YouTube course and, and many, many other things as well. I will do it because it's one of the things I need to do in my life. And I'm going to go meet with, with Tony Robbins uh, in, in, in a week and a half and spend five or six days with him. He has some business curriculum he does, which should be a lot of fun. And I know that Tony in the past has talked about the importance of, of meditating as well as breathing exercises. And a lot of great athletes are great because they breathe the right way. I know it sounds out there, especially long distance runners. And so if I get any more tidbits uh, card, uh, after that event, I'll prom I promise to share them with you. And I promise to start using that app as well. Sorry about that. All right, next question is, hi, Chris. Hey, how do you get capital with the least credit line? So can I generate revenue from selling services or products on YouTube? What is the cost to be viewed and, and reach prospects. Okay, so a couple questions there. Um, so it, it's so if you want to raise money, um, a, a couple days ago, I published a, a vlog, uh, which uh, it tells you how to raise money or how to think about raising money. Actually, it was um, it was it was I think it was yesterday I published that vlog. It, just watch that vlog if you get a chance. And the bottom line there is I say raise as much money as you can when you can, because what happens is this. A lot of people start companies. And the reason they start companies is because they're very good at skill X. And skill X is what people did working for other people. So say I work at a big company and I'm very good at skill X. And I'm like, screw this. I want to make more money. I quit. I start my own company to do skill X. But I fail for a couple reasons. Number one is because you didn't plan enough. And when I say you, I'm talking to the person that started the company. And number two, because they didn't realize just how difficult it is to raise money and how much of a distraction that can be. And so the model usually is that if you start a company, you raise some money from some wealthy people. Then a year or two later, uh, you get a big venture capital firm to back you. Then a year or two later, you raise more money from a venture capital firm in subsequent rounds called the A round, B round, C round, etc. The problem is that every year when you go to raise money, you're not focused on skill X as much as you should be. And so I say raise as much money as you can when you can. And I have a vlog on, on how to raise money. If you want, you can watch that as well. It's a presentation I gave to HSA MBA students uh, from Paris on that topic. Uh, and you can also take my complete business plan course, uh, which will walk you through the whole process of creating an amazing business model, as well as raising money as well. Now, I don't want you to raise money uh, from, um, from banks. Okay? I don't want you to ever get a loan. I want you to get um, a, a wealthy person to invest in your company or a venture capital firm eventually. And I say that because banks are chicken. If, 
you are one day late on your loan, they might take away your house. And it happened to my next door neighbor growing up. And for those of you that took my entire MBA one uh, in one course, 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 uh, there's a section where I talk about uh, my next door neighbor in Mississauga, Canada, how they lost their house because they got a bank loan. But if you do get a bank loan and go that way, I want you to register the company and talk to a lawyer. I'm not a lawyer. And the reason I say register the company is because if your company does go belly up, uh, then what happens is the bank cannot come after you or your children or your family stuff. Uh, they'll just go after the company, which, which is a separate legal entity. Okay. Great, but I don't want you to get loans from a bank. I want you to get high net worth people to invest. And the best advice I can give you is go to my website and read my free 200 page networking book. So go to haroonventures.com, all lowercase, uh, and download that book. And I promise you, it will help you to be able to network to not only raise money, but also get a job and sell more stuff. Got to be careful of the shadows here because the, the, the one light I have here. All right, my disaster recovery plan is working okay today. All right. So, and, and when it comes to, um, you had a follow up there on, um, on, on YouTube, um, there, there's no cost to be viewed. That's the beautiful thing of YouTube. Anybody can create any videos they want. And what I'm doing right now is uh, I'm in the process of creating a course called the complete YouTube course, but I'm actually going to release a number of courses this year. Uh, so I'm giving away competitive intelligence here, but I, I don't care. Um, I'm not doing it for the money. One of the courses is actually going to be on how to make great YouTube images. And in that course, I teach you how to use more than 10 different software products from scratch. Uh, and so people do judge a cover by, or a book by its cover. Um, so having a great YouTube image is important as well as the title. I'll share more details with that as I get closer to releasing that course. Uh, but again, it's, uh, I don't want you to spend any money on this stuff because you can do it all for free anyway. Okay. All right. Um, Next up is uh, Phyllis Walker, the hummingbird lady. I, I love that. Thank you, Phyllis. Uh, what, I, I love that. We actually have hummingbirds here in our backyard. They're not here right now because it started to rain a bit. Uh, but we have lavender that they, they, uh, they, they come and they stay still. And anyway, it's, it's pretty cool stuff. Love your, love your, uh, your, your, your brand name there. It's cool. Um, first time tuning in. Great info. Thanks. Thank you. Welcome. Welcome. And I hope you come back too. All right. I got a question from Crypto Sipto. What up, Crypto Sipto? Uh, hi, Chris. Uh, do I need to have a license if I want to help people set up their crypto accounts? Wow. I know brokers need a Series 7. Also, do I need protection from involving people in risky crypto markets? Okay, yeah. So anytime you're going to deal with anybody in business, um, I strongly suggest, and if you're, you're doing it yourself, your own company, I strongly suggest talking to a lawyer. I'm not a lawyer, but talk to a lawyer and set up a legal structure. It could be an LLC which stands for a limited liability corporation. It could be something else. And I say this because uh, there's a lot of risk, especially in the cryptocurrency markets, uh, and there's a lot of lawsuits too. And so whenever you ask people to invest in your company or invest in any financial services product, you have to have lawyers create what's called a prospectus. It's an offering memorandum. And all it is is a booklet which provides all the risks. So please, before you get involved in that business, talk to a lawyer. Please, please, please. Uh, I want to save you the heartache of, of maybe you'll do things the wrong way uh, and, and, and you'll get sued. I don't want that to happen to you. And for anybody starting a company, um, I, I want you to always create a separate legal entity that houses that company, like an LLC, et cetera. Again, I'm not a lawyer. Please do speak with a real professional lawyer before going down that route. And just be careful when it comes to cryptocurrencies, because before you invest in any IPO or initial public offering in the stock market, uh, the government uh, makes you and your lawyers and your investment bankers create a big book, again, called a prospectus. It's really, really big. And you can actually, uh, it's called an S1. You can go to sec.gov and read it. And what I'm going to do right now is I actually want to go to sec.gov and show you that document. Uh, and as always, my answers are always very generic uh, so that uh, everybody can get value, hopefully, uh, out of my answers. So let me just go here to screen share. Stay with me here. All right, great. Here we are there in screen share. Uh, and then what I'm going to do is um, I'm going to go over to sec.gov. Okay, So I'm going to show you the whole process of doing an IPO when it comes to uh, uh, financial um, uh, prospectuses. Okay, So 
what you can do is you go to sec.gov. And so every country has their own version of sec.gov. sec.gov is America's version and Canada. It's called CEDAR. Other countries have their own versions. And basically what it means is this. If you're going to list on the stock markets in the United States, for example, uh, you have to actually list your S1 prospectus so investors can read it first before they decide to buy or not buy the stock. And I'll show you that here. Um, and this website has just changed. It actually looks a lot better now. All right. So let's enter in the ticker for Facebook, FB. And we're going to find the uh, S1 uh, or IPO documents uh, for, for Facebook. And you'll see a number of other filings here. 8K means a press release. 10Q means a, a quarterly earnings uh, document. 10K is the annual report. But what we're looking for is the S1. So we're going to search for S-1. All right, great. So here's the S1 for uh, for Facebook. And always take the one that doesn't have a slash A initially. A means amendment. Start reading the S1 at the bottom first and then read the others if you want to. And we see that this was published on February 2nd, uh, 2012. Pardon me, February 1st, 2012, which was before the uh, Facebook IPO. And by law, Facebook had to publish this before the IPO, well in advance of the IPO, so that all potential investors get access to the same information at the same time and all investors can decide if they want to invest in Facebook or not. So let's go through this, this statement here. Okay, so I'm going to click here. Here it is here. It, it looks boring. Um, you don't have to read the whole three thing. You can search for keywords. So I'm going to show you how to do that in a second. But this document here, and you can see here, it's extraordinarily long. It's mostly black and white text, a couple of images, um, a couple of statistics. Uh, back then, um, they only had 845 million users, a lot higher today, billions now. Um, and then here you can see that you go through the entire business model as well as the pros and cons of the company, the management team, what management makes. You can do research on the management team here as well. Uh, and you can also read about risks. So I'm going to click here on risks. So here's a bunch of risks and it's very long. And lawyers create this document uh, along with um, investment bankers. All right, good. Sorry, I just want to make sure we're still recording. Great. And so what you can do is you can read through the risks in Facebook or any company for that matter before you decide to uh, in invest. Uh, and so here's one risk here. We generate a substantial majority of our revenue from advertising. Um, and, and anyway, you, you, can, you can read through that. So in 2009, 98% of their business model revenue-wise was advertising, which went down to 85% in 2011. It's probably a lot lower now. Now, I know, like I, I invested in Facebook when it was a private company, and I sold it before it went public. Then I invested in the IPO, and I actually sold it on, on day one. And the reason I sold it on day one, and it's been a great investment since, I'm just, I just don't do public stocks often. The reason I sold it, and I was really worried, was, was because back in 2012, do you remember back in 2012 when you used Facebook and you might have used it on Android or iOS and there was no app you can download, right? There's no app. It was just browser based. It was ridiculous. And so they didn't have a mobile strategy. And so I was worried about that at the time also for not just the fact they didn't, they didn't have that, that mobile app, but because I was worried that you know, if as people start to use Facebook in a mobile app longer term or using this device, the real estate on the screen is a lot lower, so you can't put as many ads. They've since worked on that. And they've had sponsored stories, which has worked out um, exceptionally well for them. But if I do a search here, control F on the word mobile, I can look for all instances of the word mobile. And somewhere within this document, I remember seeing the fact they didn't have a mobile app. Okay. So anyway, I, I searched through here, uh, reading through the risk. You can do the same as well. Um, but before you invest in any IPO or any publicly traded company ever, please read the S1 document. Please do so. Now, when it comes to cryptocurrencies, most times you don't get an S1 document because cryptos are not regulated in most countries by governments. And so the risks are not disclosed. And so you can get scammed. So please be careful. Uh, and in my course called the, uh, the, the Complete Cryptocurrency Course, uh, I've set up here a 49-step research process for you. Okay, um, And I go through 49 different steps to look at before deciding whether or not to invest in a cryptocurrency. It's way down here. It's, it's a long course. Sorry. It's... Um, 
It's actually, um, I think it's tw 24 hours long. It's in here somewhere, sorry. <laughs> oh, here they are, sorry. Yeah, here, here they are. Okay, so all the frameworks are listed here, all the research steps, all of them, all of them, all of them, okay? And I go into a ton of detail as well so that you can analyze using my 49 steps, the cryptocurrency market. I was trying to make it kind of fun too because uh, the 49ers, that's our football team here in San Francisco, uh, named after the gold rush in 1849, the 49ers. Cryptocurrency is sort of a gold rush, but just buyer beware, caveat emptor, as they say. Okay, so hopefully that explains uh, how I do my due diligence uh, on companies before investing in publicly traded ones. That's just part of my process. And I hope that you all do the same for all financial instruments that you consider investing in. And if there's a lack of information, don't invest. You know, sometimes the best decision you can make is to pass, meaning not investing at all. Okay. All right, now let me get back into bigger Chris mode. Sorry, one second. It's just easier for all of you to, to, to see me. There we go. There we go. All right. Uh, and I have to do one quick thing. Don't go anywhere. Wrigley, don't roll your eyes, buddy. But I'm a perfectionist in the top left-hand corner. You see that there? You can see that. I know you can. I want to get. I want to crop that left side there a touch. You see? All right, good. It's gone. All right. I, I, can, I can hear. I hear Wrigley rolling his eyes. <laughs> okay. Next question. Uh, so crypto sip though, hopefully that answers your question. Uh, next question is from uh, Kardik. Uh, Kardik is saying, um, how do you open DeMat account and how can I buy international stocks from it? Um, I, I don't know what a DeMat account is. I'm sorry, uh, but please let me know. But for anybody that wants to buy uh, stocks on different markets, quite often you can buy those stocks in your own market. And they're called ADRs in America, which stands for American Depository Receipt. And so instead of buying SAP, which is a great big German software company, instead of buying SAP on the German market, you can actually buy it in America with the same ticker SAP. Well, the ticker's a little bit different, but you get the idea. So for those of you that want to invest in foreign companies, you don't have to go to the other exchange. In all cases, you can invest sometimes in your own exchange if you want to. If you do that, make sure it's liquid. And I, what, I, what I found actually, and, and I'm going to show all of you that because you, you might, one day you might actually want to go and, and actually um, and, and invest um, in, in another company outside of your, your main market. So Let's go through this together. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna use my favorite website ever for finance stuff, which I can't spell anymore. Finance.yahoo. <laughs> Thank you, Google, you complete me. Okay, and what you can do here, so if I typed in SAP, if I typed in SAP, you see a number of different SAPs come up, big German software company. So we see here, this is SAP here uh, in, in, in America. Uh, this is SAP here in Germany. And this is a different SAP. It's a Pudo uh, on the Toronto Stock Exchange. Okay, so if I want, I can invest in the German version of it here. Okay, and it's a very liquid stock, meaning it trades a lot. And you can see that the volume today already is over a million shares. It trades like water, it trades uh, exceptionally well. Now. If we were to look at SAP on the uh, here we go on the local markets here, you can see the volume is lower. See it there? It's under a million shares, and that usually happens. And I, I bring this up for a reason because if you invest in illiquid stocks, illiquid stocks own you in a down market, not vice versa. And so when you invest in a lot of stocks uh, that are not listed on their primary market, meaning they're listed in your market you gotta be careful of liquidity. And I'm gonna give you an example. Okay, so let's look at Nintendo. So N Nintendo, the ticker in Tokyo on, on the Nikkei is 7974, okay? And it trades a lot. And so the average volume is this amount here, uh, 1.8 or 2 million shares today. It, it traded a lot more as well. Now, remember that number because I'm gonna show you that, that here, if we look at Nintendo here in America on what's called the pink sheets on the smaller exchange, um, the volume is really, really low. And so the volume here is only 138,000 shares, which is a lot lower, obviously, uh, than, um, than it is in Tokyo. And the average volume is 400,000 shares. And I bring this up because I want you to be mindful of liquidity before you invest in any stock, period. 
So hopefully that answers your question. If you have follow-ups, uh, please let me know. All right, let me go back. And now we're gonna go to, ah, don't go anywhere, hold on. All right, good. Hold on one second. Sorry guys, I'll be right with you, okay? All right. It's fine. Okay, what, what, what you didn't see behind the scenes there was that my the browser window didn't open up or the, the Wirecast file didn't, didn't open up properly. Okay, great. All right, next up, I've got uh, a question from Omer. Omer, how are you? First time I've seen you on the call. Um, what is your progress in making a Udemy course? How, do you, how did you learn to make an online course? Uh, and do I have a source to recommend? A absolutely. So I, I think that everybody should teach. You know, every, everybody has something to teach and, and share with, with the whole world. And so what I want to do is I, I'm actually going to show you, um, I, I'm going to show you here um, how to do it. And it's free. Okay. And everybody should do it. And, and Wrigley, who works with me, is in the process of teaching courses as well. I'm encouraging to, him to do it. Um, it. It's a great business model as well. So what you can do is this. You can go to Udemy and I'm going to give you two free courses. Okay. You can go to Udemy and just go to go to my profile page. And you'll see that on my profile page, uh, I've got a, a ton of courses. Uh, I want you to go and click through. And the first course I want you to take uh, is a course called 40 Tips on Making a Great Online Course. And it's one and a half hours long. And I have it in 12 different languages as well, translated versions. And the reason I created it was I wanted to share with you and with the world the easy way to make courses online for free. And I also wanted you to understand my mistakes. And so I published this course, which, called, which is called 40 Tips on Making a Great Online Course, based on my 40 mistakes teaching online so that you don't have to make those 40 mistakes. And I do this course every year. And so what I did was um, last year, uh, I created another course here called Another 40 Tips on Making a Great Online Course. I went overboard on this one. This one here is four hours long. I give you 40 more tips on stuff I learned over the year on mistakes I made teaching online so you can work smarter, not harder. But I think everybody has something to teach and everybody should teach. And when one teaches, two learn. And the great thing about teaching online is it's the most scalable business model that's ever been created, ever. If you think about it, if you're a doctor or God forbid a lawyer, and, and I love I love lawyers if they're civil rights lawyers, otherwise, whatever. I don't know, maybe, sort of. But if you're a doctor or, or a lawyer, you can only treat one patient at a time. If you're a teacher and you teach online, you can teach the entire world or every country at the same time. It's You upload your, your courses, you write once, read many. The whole world has access to it. And I have, I'm humbled to say I, I have students now in every country in the world. And so I think that teaching is the most scalable business model that's ever been created. And for more details on why this is my thesis, please watch my keynote uh, from when I, when I spoke uh, at, event, at an event uh, co-sponsored by Udemy uh, in Brazil uh, on, um, on, on, on teaching online. Now check it out. Um, if you're watching the replay of this, here's the graphic. You can click on this logo here or, or, or the card in the corner in YouTube and watch that video or just go to, to youtube.com and find my vlog and you'll see it there. So hopefully that, that answered the question for you on, on teaching um, uh, on, uh, on, 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 U on, on Udemy. Uh, if you have any follow-up questions from that, as always, please let me know. Thank you. All right, next up I've got, um, what do I think about studying? Uh, oh, and one more quick thing, if you teach online, sorry. Only do it if you love the topic, if you're passionate about it. Otherwise it won't do well. You have to Think with your heart first, and then this will work a lot better. I promise you this. I promise you. And there's a market for everything. That guy Ninja, who's a, a big uh, a big YouTuber now, uh, and, and he plays Fortnite and makes millions of dollars a year. He started out, actually, most people don't know this. He started out teaching uh, on, on Udemy. He had a course on Udemy a couple, couple of years ago, I think. And, and my son took it because my son wants to learn how to use Twitch or streaming online. So everybody has something to teach. I promise you, you do. Uh, and there's this wonderful woman named uh, Teresa uh, Greenway, I think her name is, and she teaches uh, on how to bake bread. And it's an amazing story uh, because uh, a couple of years ago, 
she had an awful life. Uh, she had an abusive husband. Uh, she was living off of food stamps. Um, she had many children and she got the courage to leave him and she left him and she started teaching on Udemy on how to bake bread, how to bake sourdough bread and all this stuff. And it's amazing. And God bless her. And gosh, it's so prophetic just thinking of that, uh, teaching how to make bread. Um, such an amazing story. Check out her courses if you get a chance. Thanks. All right. Next up I've got here is what do I think about... Um, and, and Wrigley, just do me a, let me know if the, the video and the sound's okay still. I've got the door open here, um, and it's, it's windy. Sorry. What do you think about studying industrial engineering? Is it the future, or is it too general? So what I would say is study whatever you're most passionate about. Do whatever you're most passionate about in life. Okay. Don't let anybody ever tell you how to live your life. And on December 26th, which is Boxing Day in Canada, I published a vlog on that topic. Please watch it. Please watch it. Because it'll help you to decide what career path you should take in life. If you love industrial engineering, then do it. And Johnny Ive, uh, who actually is the, uh, the brilliant dude at Apple uh, with the British accent. He speaks a lot gooder than I do because he has a British accent. Um, Johnny Ive is, is the guy that designed a lot of great products and, and he focused on industrial engineering as well. Um, anyway, do a search on Johnny Ive if you want. I, I actually met him at a, at a San Francisco uh, MoMA fundraiser event uh, years ago uh, and I went up to him and I, and I talked to him it, and I remember asking him at the time, I said, the, the Apple Watch is coming out soon. What is the killer app going to be? And he said he didn't know at that time. He said it might be along the lines of when a husband and wife are in bed and, and there's a newborn in the middle, um, when, and I've been there many times, when my alarm used to go off, I'd wake up, the baby was a disaster. But what he said was with the Apple Watch, and this is before it came out, he said, and he said it in an amazing British accent that, that had me sold. You had me at Hello, Johnny Ive. He said, you have this brilliant uh, haptic feedback that will tap you gently on the wrist to wake you up instead of having an alarm go off. Everybody's happy that way. My accent sucks, I know, I know, I tried. Uh, but anyway, um, he did that, and, and I'm sure he didn't just do it uh, because uh, there was money in it. He did it because he loves it, industrial engineering, that is. And there's another guy you can look up named Yves Bahar, and he's made a lot of great products, including the August Lock, uh, which is an IoT or Internet of Things-based lock uh, that I have, which is only okay. But the design's amazing, right? And he's designed a lot of amazing things. You can Google him as well. Yves Bahar, he focused on um, industrial design as well. Nice guy. All right. Um, next question is, what are my thoughts on oil ETFs? So for those of you that aren't familiar with ETFs, they stand for exchange traded funds. And what that means is you can invest in any, uh, any sector you want using a certain ticker. And so the best way for me to explain that to you is um, I'm actually just going to make myself disappear this time. Uh, and then I'll, I'll use a screencast and then we'll go over here to, um, we're going to go to Yahoo Finance. I'm going to show you a couple of them. Okay. So uh, one of them I, I used to invest in was called the, the OIH or the oil services index, I think. And, and so here it is here, uh, oil services ETF. Yeah. And as always, you can click on the holdings. Okay, we're still broadcasting. Great. You can look on the holdings and you can see what the holdings are here. So you got Schlumberger, Halliburton. These are offshore drillers, a Transocean, uh, et cetera. So you can do that. You can also do another one called the OSX. That's another index. Oh, it used to be. Is it gone now? Oh, wow. I, I, it was an index I invested in years ago. Maybe, is this it here? ETF? commodity grains. Now, anyway, there, there's many different ETFs. So maybe if I type oil ETF, here we go. Okay, here's a bunch of them. All right, so I'll go through these with you, okay? So this one here is, whenever you see 3X, I want you to be really careful because 3X means whatever the stocks in that index go up, you'll get three times more than that. It's levered three times. Leverage is very, very dangerous. And remember, Warren Buffett said that uh, leverage and derivatives are financial weapons of mass destruction. So if we look at this one here, the ProShares Ultra, please don't buy it because you can lose just as much on the way down as well. But if you look at the holdings here, um, it's just crude, okay? It's WTI crude. That's just plain oil. So you got a big leverage to crude there. 
dangerous. And it's not 100% of the assets, it's 300% because it's levered three times. Very dangerous. Let's look at some more oil ETFs. And for those of you not interested in oil, uh, say you're from Brazil, you could type here on, on like Wrigley's from Brazil, really works for me. Uh, you can look at EWZ, which is the ticker for the ETF uh, on Brazil. And here you have uh, Petrobras. You've got a great copper company called CBR Devale here. A lot of great companies. Let's go back to oil though and look at a couple of others. I try to make my answers generic always for everybody. Um, there's different types of oil too. There's Brent, there's Sweet Crude. There's a lot of different types. Uh, but what you can also do is here, uh, this here is sponsored by Bank of Montreal, uh, which is obviously a big bank in, in Canada, it used to be the biggest. Uh, and you can look here at what the components are. And these are all Canadian stocks. Okay. Uh, actually, some of them are not Canadian. You have Transocean here as well. That's American. Uh, but you can buy the ETF on the Toronto Stock Exchange, TO, Toronto. Ticker in Toronto is Z or Z for Americans, J O. Let's look at one more oil ETF and then we'll move on, I promise you. All right, I'm just curious. So let's look at this one. Okay, this one here is the opposite of this one. Okay, this one here is when you, you own it and if it, you're gonna get three times the increase in the price of oil. This one is the opposite, meaning if oil goes down, you make three times the amount it goes down. Okay, it's a short, okay, which means betting against. It's the opposite of long. A long is what uh, mutual funds own, stocks, and hedge funds own longs and shorts. If you want more color there, I can go into more detail. Otherwise, I, I'm going to move on to the, uh, the the next question. Give me a, a second here to find my bearings. All right, hold on a second, sorry. All right, and, it's, and if that rain in, in the background is, is annoying to anybody, uh, just, just uh, let me know or, or, or Wrigley let me know. Wrigley said everything's fine now, which is good. Thank you. All right, next up I've got is, do I agree with Warren Buffett's uh, claim that Bitcoins are non-productive assets? All you're counting on is the next person is going to pay you more because they're even more excited about another person coming along. Um, I, I have a, a tremendous amount of respect for, for Warren Buffett and... I carry this book with me or I have it in my, 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 my office always. Uh, sorry about the green screen there. Hey, tomorrow in the future. Uh, with Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies, it's a little bit different of a financial instrument. Um, now, one thing that I know that Warren Buffett agrees with me on um, is, um, or I should say the other way around, he's here, I'm down here, <laughs> uh, is, is that you always want to have, whenever you invest in anything, a limited amount of supply. Okay, uh, so if... A company created a quadrillion or trillion shares. If, some, if a company created a trillion shares and kept printing shares, then it doesn't matter how good the company is, that stock would go down a lot. The great thing about Bitcoin is that there is a dearth or a limit on the number of shares that can ever be created or coins minted. And that limit is 21 million. There will never be more than 21 million Bitcoins ever created. Okay, so there's a limit on the supply. And for those of you doing your research on cryptocurrencies, make sure you understand the supply. Is there a limit on supply? Or can more cryptos be created from scratch? An unlimited amount. And so that's one thing that I personally like about Bitcoin, for example, is that there are only 21 million um, Bitcoins that will ever be created. And they'll all be created by the year 2140, roughly. Because that's the, the, the mining algorithm. That's just how it works. It's the mathematics behind it. A certain amount are released every year. And so you might ask yourself, well, Chris, that's not very many. If there's only 21 million uh, Bitcoin ever created, then why should I own it? I mean, there's whatever. Nobody can own it. Only a handful can, right? What if somebody corners the market? Very unlikely. Because the creator of Bitcoin, which is a dude, apparently, we're not sure, named Satoshi. What Satoshi did was he allows you to buy very tiny slices of Bitcoins as well, called Satoshis. So hopefully that, that answered your, your question. Thanks. All right, let's see what is next. Hi, Haroon. What up, Fatima? I hope uh, that people used to call me baboon when I was in, in high school. They call me baboon. I don't know why. It rhymes with my last name, I guess. Don't anybody call me baboon, okay? I'm very sensitive. Okay, just kidding. All right. Um, hi, Haroon. Hope you're doing well. I have some questions about my business. I want to start by when I start something, I'm blocked and I don't know why. Okay, and I'll keep reading yours and the, the questions in between, I'll come back to you. 
I take many of your courses, uh, but now I feel very tired and I can't do anything. What do you think I should force myself to do um, or take care of my health uh, after I return on? So I, I don't I don't fully understand all the questions. I, I apologize. It's me, not you. Um, it sounds like a breakup. It's not me. It's you. Somebody told me that years ago. All right. Sorry. But... <laughs> When you start a company, I want you to do something you're passionate about. Uh, and you mentioned that it's hard for you to bring yourself to finish uh, a, a course or to create a, a company. If you start a company that you're in, in a market you're passionate about, that's not going to be an issue. You know, do what you love in life. You know, Mark Twain had a great quote. He said, the two most important days in a person's life are number one, the day you're born. And number two, the day you find out why. So what is your passion? What's your raison d'etre? What, what do you love in business? Who's a rock star to you in business? Is it Sir Richard Branson? Is it a musician? Is it an athlete? If it's one of those three aforementioned uh, roles, then start a company like Richard Branson has or become a musician or, or be an athlete if you want to. And a lot of people will say, I, I want to be a musician or a rock star, but you know, I, I'm, I'm too old. It's bullshit. Sorry for swearing. Now, now I'm going to be unmonetized. I get it on YouTube. Sorry. Sort of. But why isn't there a seven-year-old rock star, a new one? Why isn't there? It can happen. And if you're on this call, I hope that's you. So start companies in sectors that you're really, really passionate about. You know, nobody has ever been really successful, uh, has started a company just for the money. They do what they love doing. You know, Bill Gates, God bless him. He's doing wonderful things for the world. He started Microsoft because he loves software. He's passionate about software. Sir Richard Branson started every one of his companies because he's passionate about all of his, sub his divisions and his companies. The same thing with Mark Benioff. He's passionate about cloud software. I want you to be passionate about whatever company it is that you want to start. And I want to humbly help you get there. So if I can help you in any way at all, you know, please come to this call every Thursday and ask me as many questions as you want to about your business model. And take my complete business plan course if you want to as well. Because planning to fail is failing to plan. Maybe it's the other way around. around. Failing to plan is planning to fail. Make sure you write a thorough business plan first. And it doesn't have to be my course. You can take other people's courses as well. Or do searches online or buy books on how to make a business plan. But make your business plan first before starting a company. Uh, because you might decide halfway through making that business plan that it's just not worth launching that company. Do what you're passionate about and write a business plan first. Thanks. All right. Let me get a sip of my, my, my coffee here. Okay. So a question I've got is from, from um, oh, I, I missed a bunch in between there. Sorry. And, and, uh, and, and Fatima, if that didn't answer your question, please let me know. Please. Love your name. Great name. Love it. Okay. Um, and there was actually, was it my mom when I was a kid told me about the story of story of Fatima. I think it was in, in Portugal where these, uh, these, these three kids saw um, uh, uh, Mary, the, the mother of Jesus, at Fatima or something. Anyway, sorry to go off, off, off topic there. Just what came to my mind. That's what happens when you get older like me. Just, you just say what's on your mind. There's no filter. All right, so Kardec is saying, what are futures and how do they work? Can you explain it in simple terms? Yeah, absolutely. So I published a, a vlog, I think it was two days ago, on derivatives. How do derivatives work? So futures are part of derivatives. And so derivatives means an investment in something where you make money or protect your money based on the rate of change. Okay, so within the derivatives markets, you can buy options. And options will allow you to bet that a stock is going to go up or down by buying calls or puts. Again, go back to my previous vlog on that one if you want to watch the topic on that. Another subsidiary or derivative instrument is futures. And futures basically allows you to bet on what the price of something is going to be in the future. And you'll see a lot of commodity traders will invest in futures on the CBOE or the Chicago Board of Exchange, I think it's called, in Chicago. And what I want you to do, and I love movies, uh, I want you to watch the movie Trading Places. It's a great movie with uh, Dan Aykroyd, uh, Eddie Murphy, 
And basically what they do is they trade futures and they make a fortune. Okay, And that exchange is in Philadelphia, but there's also a big one uh, in, in Chicago. And the reason why futures were created was because many years ago, sorry to bore you with the historical stuff, but many years ago, what happened was trains would ship stuff between different time zones. And they wanted to know by the time they got to their destination, what the price would be in the future when they get there for the commodity that they were shipping. If you have any follow-up questions about that, please let me know. Thanks. All right. Next question is, what is the best way to stay ahead of my competition? Love that question. I want you to think like your competitor does. Right? There, there's something called game theory, which means thinking how your opponent might think. And if you want, you can read a book called Sun Tzu and the Art of War. In that book, there's a quote, which is, every battle is won before it's been fought. So what I want you to do is use game theory. I want you to think of what your competition is going to do next. And with this new digital reality, there's great ways of finding out in uh, competitive intelligence without breaking the law about your competition. And one of the best ways is this. If you work in sales, I want you to go to Twitter. And I want you to find salespeople from other companies, your competition. And I want you to look at who they follow because there's a very good chance they follow their customers. They follow their customers. That's great competitive intelligence for you. And you can go after the customers as well. You know, obviously do it in an ethical way, but why not? Why not? So that's one way to uh, become much more competitive and stay ahead of your competition. Because if you look at their Twitter feeds, you, you know what they're thinking, but they don't know what you're thinking. Another thing is this. Don't ever follow anybody on social media that can tip your hat or give away what you're thinking from a competitive perspective. And also, as a side note, don't follow politicians, please. Because what happens is if somebody notices that you follow a certain politician, then half the people might not like you as much. I don't know what happened. Okay, so those are some great tips for you to be much more competitive. Um, but I always want you to think of game theory. I want you to think one step ahead of the competition. And here's a great example of game theory. So my, my kids, when the Nintendo Switch came out, you couldn't find it anywhere. My, my kids wanted to get the Switch. My kids only, not me. And you couldn't find it anywhere. So I went to, um, I went to eBay. And I couldn't find the Nintendo Switch except for crazy prices like thousands of bucks, whatever. And so what I did was this. I used game theory. I started thinking like other people might. And so I thought to myself, hmm, if somebody lists their Nintendo Switch for sale, but they type the word Nintendo wrong, maybe they type Nintendo instead of D-O at the end, T-O they type, then maybe I'll find that listing. And that's what happened. I found it, nobody bid on it because nobody searched for it, nobody found it. And that's how I found it, using game theory. And I do the same thing. I'm so upset that I'm telling you this right now, but I have to. I'm, there, I'm, I'm transparent as always. I do the same thing with hockey cards. For years, I've been going on eBay and searching for Wayne Gretzky rookie card. And a Wayne Gretzky rookie card in perfect condition is $100,000. Uh, there's only a handful of them, though. But I would search for Wayne Gretzky rookie card, but I would spell Wayne Gretzky or Gretzky with an S at the end instead of a Z, as we say in Canada. It's not Z, it's Z. Uh, and that's, that's just another example of game theory. And so always think like the competition does or like other people do in business. And before you ever go to any business meeting, I always want you to go and see who they follow on Twitter. It'll tell you a lot about them, you know, what sports they love. And sports is great boardroom talk as well, which I talked about in another vlog as well. And by searching Twitter to see who they follow, it gives you great competitive intelligence as well when you go into that meeting. You know, they might follow their business partners. You know, they might follow things you're interested in as well, which could be great icebreakers. You know, maybe they follow uh, the Beatles or you too. And maybe you could spark up a conversation like that um, in, your, um, in your meeting with them. So anyway, those are just a couple of tips uh, to prepare yourself for a meeting and how to think about competitive intelligence. But always think about how other people think before you go to a meeting with them. And understand what people are motivated by. You know, most people are motiva motivated by about three things. Number one, make more money. Number two, get promoted faster. And maybe number three, enjoy their work. So if you go into a job interview, how can you make them more money? 
If they work in sales, maybe bring a number of leads for them that you can share with them, people that might want to purchase their product or service, that sort of thing. Okay. Let's see. Next question I've got here is from uh, Lamarck. Uh, glad to have you, buddy. How are you? Uh, Mark uh, uh, is, joins us quite often, always has great questions. Um, okay, so let me see here. Am I still doing venture capital? Is Shark Tank TV uh, show running a venture capital firm? Okay, yeah, so that's a, that's a great question. So, um, so the question's about Shark Tank uh, and venture capital in general. Uh, so let me let me just start off with, with Shark Tank. So for those of you that are overseas, Shark Tank is a very uh, popular American program where you have a bunch of very successful business people judging business models. Uh, and I, I think that what happens is this, and I've known a couple of companies, people that have gone on Shark Tank, and it's not what you think it is. It's a great show, and my kids love watching it too, and so do I. It's fun. What happens is this. Although you and I see somebody for 5, 10, 15 minutes pitching their business model on Shark Tank. They were actually there for a couple hours. And what happens is the producers in post edit will shorten the two or three hour video into the most fun or interesting parts. Okay, and one thing I, I think that, that is really helpful though is when you watch Shark Tank or shows like that, I want you to focus on how the entrepreneurs tend to want to invest in people that um, are very sales oriented, right? They're very charismatic or they have uh, experience in that sector. And Mark Cuban, who's a smart guy who sold broadcast.com to Yahoo for billions of dollars in late 1999. Mark Cuban had this great quote years ago. He said that ideas are commodities, but execution is not. And so I know that Mark Cuban and a lot of great investors uh, on Shark Tank and in life in general, they love investing in great management teams first and then the business model second. And so whenever I meet with companies that I'm looking to invest in, uh, I'm not just looking at the business model, I'm looking at the management team. And I'm also thinking of myself as a customer and the person presenting to me as a salesperson. Do they get me excited about that product or not? Because I know that their business model is gonna change a lot if they're early stage company. And I want them to be able to change with that and to excite me or potential or customers or business partners, no matter what, even if the business model changes in the long run. Now, as a follow-up there, you asked, do I still do venture capital? I mean, I do a, a bit. I don't really invest very much. Um, I never invest in my students' business models. But if I find something that's amazing, I might invest a little bit. But I don't have a, a specific venture capital fund set up. Um, if I do investments, I like to do one-offs uh, in what are called special purpose vehicles or SPVs, uh, which means this. So the way a venture capital firm works is investors pay a management fee of 2% annually and 20% of the incentive as well. And I can go into more details there if you care. What I like to do or look into doing is investing in one company, but instead of having that as part of a fund, it's part of a one stock portfolio, so to speak. And it's called a special purpose vehicle. And of course I get lawyers involved if and when I do this. And the fees there are only 1% and 10% of the upside. It's lower because it's not a diversified portfolio. It's a one stock or one private company investment portfolio. And so if I were to invest in more venture capital firms, that is the approach I would take, the SPV approach or special purpose vehicle approach. But my passion right now, what I'm focusing most of my time on is just, just, just teaching. I'm having, having so much fun doing this. This is fun for me. Okay. All right. Hopefully it's fun for you too. All right. I'm going to do a focus check to see if autofocus is on. Hold on. All right. Hold on. Hopefully it's on. All right. So Wrigley, how is the, uh, the focus? Is, is the focus working or not? should be fun. Okay, great. Do one more check. I'm so sorry. I just got to check. All right. Yeah, Wrigley, let me know if I'm, I'm out of focus uh, or, or, or not. Thanks, Ben. Um, that's better focus there, right? So back here is out of focus. Up here is in focus more so, I think. All right, that's where I'll stay then. All right. Sorry about that. All right, next one I've got is, uh, bah, 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 bah. 
Um, I take many of your courses. Oh, that was Fatima still. That's right. If you're having trouble sleeping, just take my courses, please. All right. So um, Kardec is, is asking, how do you get balance sheet information from 2011 onwards on a quarterly basis in your financial accounting and modeling course on Udemy? on Microsoft Excel. So what you have to do is you have to go to uh, the company's website and download their financials. Or what you can do is you can go to sec.gov, uh, which is a US government website where every company that's listed on the stock exchange in America have to put their financial data. And they have to release their information quarterly. And the quarterly reports uh, are called the 10Q. And I showed you earlier in the call on how to access um, sec.gov when we talked about Facebook. So just go to sec.gov like I showed you, type in the ticker name for the company you're interested in and look at 10 Qs. And you can copy and paste the data from there. And I know that you want a better resource where you can actually download it. It's hard to find that. Some websites like Yahoo Finance will allow you to, and Google Finance maybe and others, will allow you to export into what's called CSV format, which is comma separated values. And then you can import that into Excel. Excel knows the differences between the commas and puts all the information in the right cells. Or you can go to the website of that company and see if you can download the, the model there. Lastly, you can ask investor relations at any company to send you a financial model with historicals. They might do it, they might not, but you lose nothing by asking. And most people don't ask. Okay. Okay. Okay, so uh, Ananya is asking um, what I recommend for, for next step. Um, I, I don't know if there's a, a, an earlier question or comment from you. Uh, if you can just please post a little more clarity. I apologize for, uh, for that. Thanks. All right. Um, hold on a second here. All right, next question um, I, I've got is from uh, Lamarck. Uh, do I know Anton uh, Crail? Uh, I don't, sorry. He was an analyst and a trader in Goldman Sachs years ago. He's a proprietary trader. Can you explain what proprietary trading is and how does it work? Sure. So what happens is whenever you see a big trading floor, um, it's usually an investment bank like Goldman Sachs, UBS, uh, Credit Suisse, etc. And on that trading floor, you see a bunch of people in different roles. There are salespeople that sell to mutual funds. Would you like to buy stock in this company? There's sales traders that execute the trade between the mutual funds. Then there's traders. And traders will basically trade some of the bank's money. And traders are usually sector traders. They focus on one sector only. So you might have an oil trader. You might have a, a software trader, internet trader, a biotech trader, that sort of thing. Proprietary because they're dealing with the firm's proprietary money. That's why they call them prop, prop traders, proprietary traders. And if you're interested in learning more about the different financial um, uh, analyst positions, um, I've got this great video. Uh, just go to my YouTube vlog homepage, uh, scroll down, and you'll, you'll see it. It's, it's the one that had like 170,000 or so hits. Just click on that one. It's got a bunch of animated characters. Thanks. That was me showing off that I got a lot of hits on one of my videos. It's good. <laughs> All right. All right, next question. Next question I've got is from um, Abdallah. Um, thank you, Chris. Uh, I liked your 40 tips to make an online course. It really helps the, uh, with making video content. I'm looking to make a team and the best way to make good quality videos for uh, the project. That's awesome. And and I'm here to help you. So it, it, this, this is free and I don't care if you're my Udemy student or not. Um, you can come on this call every week forever and ask me as many questions as you want, technical questions too. I'll, I'll answer everything for you because I promise you every mistake that you've made uh, or will make, I've already made. I've, 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 I've been a big failure. <laughs> uh, Michael Jordan actually had that great quote. He said, I failed over and over and over again and that's why I succeed. So uh, good luck to you creating your courses. I, I hope you enjoy it. Um, it's certainly uh, changed my life uh, and my Udemy students have changed my life as well. So thank you. Thank you. All right, let's see. Um, next question. All right, this, this light is so bright. All right. All right. 
nothing I can do. All right, next question is, sorry. <laughs> I just had a senior moment there, it happens. Okay, Cardic is clarifying what Demat, Demat account is. Demat account is an account that allows investors to hold their shares uh, in electronic form. Okay, thanks. So I, I there, there's something called a custodian, custodial service, and they will hold uh, these, these paper shares for you um, so that you don't have to. Like in the past, people used to actually get paper shares. So make sure it's a reputable custodial service. Okay, and I, I don't know much about this, so I, 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 feel, I feel a little ignorant um, and, and, and uh, it wouldn't be right for me to comment on Demat. I don't know what that is, but that's what custodians are. Thanks. Okay. Thanks, hummingbird lady. I love you to me too. Okay. Okay, so Karik's got a question. This is an interesting one. I like this one. So Karik is saying, how is uh, book knowledge uh, different from the real world? So um, book knowledge is, um, it's, it can be very theoretical. Like I, I hate reading books that are, that are based on theory. I, I love like real practical stuff. Okay, and if you're from New York, um, the Blue Jays are a better team than the Yankees always, but Derek Jeter's great. And this, I brought this here because uh, my son Andrew loves Derek Jeter and Derek Jeter's a great role model. And the reason he's so successful is because he wrote down his goals in life, right? And so what I love doing is reading biographies from successful people and just learning their blueprint for success in life. I don't like reading about theory. You know, a, a lot of textbooks in universities bore me to tears. I think you can learn a lot more uh, from reading or listening to audiobooks from very successful people that have already done it because you can apply their blueprint right away and become very successful rather than reading stuff like supply and demand graphs or calculus stuff that you'll never use in real life and you know exactly what I'm talking about. Okay, so the bottom line there is that um, I, I really recommend going to, if you can, to audible.com and subscribing uh, and listen to autobiographies from successful people. That way you never have to pay attention to theory. You can just listen to the blueprints of those that have already done it. And hold on one second, guys, okay? I need to check one thing here. All right, stay with me. All right, so the, the focus is not gonna be perfect, that's fine. That's fine, it's fine, okay. So what I do, the reason I'm looking there is what I do is I, I record, I'm recording all this in 4K and then I, I upload a 4K version of certain things, snippets to, to YouTube from here. It's just fun. I'm a nerd, I know. All right, um, next up. And the reason I'm doing 4K now is because a lot of people are starting to watch YouTube uh, on, their, uh, on their televisions you know, using Apple TV or using Xbox or PS4 or whatever. So I'm trying to think like the competition is going to think longer, longer term and just get, get ahead of them there. All right, so um, next one I've got here is, Edwin is, is saying, um, I'm debating whether to major in marketing or finance. What are some key differences? Uh, what are your thoughts on those careers? So a lot of people like doing marketing because you get to be creative. You know, a lot of people that have artistic interests and study business, especially the ones that are doing business undergraduate degrees, they'll major in marketing because it's the, the one sector you can be very creative in. Um, and so if you love creativity, uh, you can look into marketing and advertising too. If you are passionate about numbers and math and finance, then study finance. Just the bottom line is do what you're most passionate about and you'll be successful. You know, the, the, the issue is though, that if you, if you chase money, you'll lose your dreams and your money. If you chase your dreams, not only will they come true over time, I promise you, if you're cool with failing a couple times, but the money will come accidentally longer term. And I want you all to feel very comfortable uh, with, with failure. I want to liberate your fear of failure. And that's the title of one of my earlier vlogs. Watch it if, if you want to. Uh, but you'll never make it big uh, if, if you don't fail many times over and over and over again. And the best way to get comfortable with failure is just telling yourself that I don't care what other people think. I don't care what people think of me. 
You know, your, your opinion of me doesn't have to become my reality. Okay. Next up. All right. All right, next up, I've, I've got a question here. And, and if, you, if this setup is good, uh, please click the like button. Um, I, I want to know if, if the setup is good or not. You're supposed to ask for likes, whatever. I hate asking for it, but I am. All right. Oh, you're welcome, Omar. Okay, now Kardik is asking, um, can I explain a short in more detail? Sure. So let me go through the anatomy of a short. So we all know that a long is buying a stock. When you buy a stock, it's called a long. So what is a short? A short is the opposite of a long. And the way a short works is you make money if the stock goes down that you're short. So here's the mechanics behind it. I'm going to pretend I'm a hedge fund. And you work at a big investment bank like Goldman Sachs. You work on the trading floor. Okay. And I call you and I say, I want to short 100,000 shares of Microsoft because I think it's going to go down. You then say to me, okay, I will find shares for you. And Microsoft trades like that. So usually you don't even have to call uh, your, your, your broker or prime broker. What happens next is this. The trader at Goldman Sachs or any firm will then go and call other mutual funds or other holders of Microsoft stock. And they'll say, can I borrow your shares? I'll give them back to you, I promise. Can I borrow them? And what happens is usually they get a very small fee from me. Okay? There's a cost to borrow. Then that person says, sure, I'll lend them to you because they're not going to sell them anyway. The mutual fund is long-term focused. The trader that says, thank you, sometimes. The trader then takes those 100 shares of Microsoft and lends them to me. I borrow them. Okay, I borrow them. And let's pretend that Microsoft is, hypothetically speaking, at 10 bucks right now. Then I will sell those shares, right? I borrow them. I sell them at 10 bucks. And I hope Microsoft goes down because I'm betting against it. I'm short the shares of Microsoft, hypothetically speaking. And let's say Microsoft goes down two bucks. It's now at $8. Then I buy those shares back and I return the 100,000 shares to Goldman Sachs or whoever I borrowed them from. And I made two bucks there. $10 minus two is two bucks. Two bucks times 100,000 shares, that's $200,000 I made. Okay, so I made 200 grand. That's how it works. That's the anatomy of a short. Now, there are some shorts that are very, very difficult to get access to because they're crowded shorts. A lot of hedge funds have already short them. In that case, it's gonna cost you a lot of money to borrow those shares. And so what would happen is, as I mentioned with the Microsoft example, and Microsoft trades like water is very liquid, quite often you don't even have to call to ask for it. You just do it electronically to short. But let's say I'm shorting a company that doesn't trade that much or it's very crowded. I will call up my broker, my salesperson, my trader, Goldman Sachs, for example, or any other firm. And I'll say, I'm looking to short 100,000 shares of company X. Do you have any shares to lend to me? Okay, and X is the ticker for U.S. Steel, but just pretend it's company X, not U.S. Steel. And they'll say, yes, but it's going to cost you 10%, meaning if I borrow those shares for a year, I'd have to pay a fee of 10% because it's a high borrow. Then I might not decide to, to borrow it. Okay, that's why some people don't short stocks that are so obviously great short candidates because the cost to borrow is high. As another side note, if a company has a dividend, then when you short a stock, you have to pay back the dividends on an annual basis. So let's say I shorted a stock where the dividend was 4%. If I held that short for a year, then I'd have to pay a 4% dividend. I'd pay that 4% fee. If it was half a year, it's a 2% fee. Half of 4% is 2%. So that's the anatomy of, of a short. Um, I don't recommend that you do it uh, because the losses can be literally infinite. Like if Microsoft stock, hypothetically speaking, remember in that example, I said I shorted at 10 bucks. Instead of it going down to eight, let's say that Microsoft stock went up to a gazillion. I'm on the hook for all of that. All of that. It's dangerous. It's dangerous. So again, I don't recommend shorting stocks, but that's how it works. If you have follow-up questions, please let me know. Thanks. All right, next question. 
is. All right, from uh, uh, Dante. Good morning, Dante. It's been a while. How are you, bud? Dante's uh, from Canada. One of my people represents. Okay, so uh, I got another question saying is, how did working in consulting help me to get where I am today? Yeah, so I think that consulting is a great place to start a career in. And I say that because what happens is you're exposed to a d ton of different types of business models and a ton of different types of clients. And it's a great way to start a career early on because you're starting to understand how different business models work because you're advising different companies. And when you're very junior, you're not going to be asked to do any difficult stuff, but you'll still be exposed to stuff when you work for your manager at a consulting firm. So I started out working at Accidenture. I mean Accenture. Sorry, bad joke. It's a great company. And it helped me a lot because I was exposed to financial services, government, uh, and different types of clients and different types of business models. And I loved it because um, I always knew that if I hated what I was doing, whatever client site I was at, if I hated it, if I wasn't enjoying it, I knew there was light at the end of the tunnel because six months from now, usually you change and go to another client site. It all, it all depends. And so for me, uh, I started out uh, working, I was in Ottawa initially, Dante, you, you'll love that, Dante's from, from Ottawa on the call here. Uh, and I worked at Accenture there and I was focused on government services. And because we were in Ottawa, there's a lot of uh, ex-military uh, employees that worked at, um, at Accenture. And so I got a really good understanding of process, rank, getting stuff done, that sort of thing, whatever. And then I moved on to do financial services. I transferred to Toronto because all of my buddies were there and I, I wanted to have more fun with them on Fridays and Saturdays. I don't know what that means. <laughs> and then what I did was I, I went and I worked on the merger of Nations Bank and Bank of America in the Carolinas. Uh, then I did offshore banking at, uh, in Barbados uh, when our client was uh, CIBC Cobsco, CIBC Offshore Banking Services Corporation Cobsco. I learned a ton. I learned a ton. I loved it. I loved it. And the beautiful thing is that they fly you back, usually big consulting firms, McKinsey, for example, all the great ones do it. They fly you back uh, so that you can spend the weekend at home, at home, or they can fly your girlfriend in. Like Christine, we first started dating. She, she was flown down to Barbados every week for a while. Bonus points represents. <laughs> uh, but the problem is this, okay? The problem is I don't want you to stay at a consulting firm longer term. I don't want you to have kids and work at a consulting firm because it's like the army. You know, where, the, where, there's a, where there's a battle, you go to where the, the battle is. That's how consulting works. It's a good metaphor. Uh, and you might not see your kids as much. And, and that's a tragic thing because you can't get that time back. Now, there are some consulting firms that have policies where you're always in the office on Friday no matter what. Like McKinsey, great, a great consulting firm that I got rejected from. You know, they, they, uh, they uh, basically allow you to come back uh, every single Thursday. Uh, or every Friday, I should say, uh, and, and spend time in the office there. So don't do it when you're older. Do it when you're younger, before you have kids, before you have kids. And it can be very political as well. It's another drawback because there's not only politics within the consulting firm, but there's also politics uh, outside of the consulting firm as well uh, on the client side. So anyway, use it as a stepping stone if, if you want to. Uh, and heck, start, heart, start your own consulting firm. Why not? Why not? Okay. All right, um, let's see, next, next one here is, all right, um, next question is uh, from Dante. I'm still doing your business plan course, awesome. And I'm trying to figure out what service people would need during an economic slowdown. Yeah, so when, I think the best time to start a company I think the best time to start a company is during a recession because, you know, business prospects aren't bright and you're running lean and mean. You, you're keeping expenses low for a good reason. And when you come out of the recession, when the economy does, and it always does, you have nice leverage to the upside. And business is always cyclical. Don't let anybody tell you that this business cycle is different. They're all basically the same. So starting a company in a recession, I think is a great thing. Now, in terms of what sectors and companies are counter cyclical, so think about stuff that you're gonna buy uh, or services you're gonna use, regardless of whether or not the economy is great. Um, so, healthcare is counter cyclical. You know, you, you get sick. And my dad actually, he had a, a massive company in Canada called Gam X Ray, 
uh, and radiology, ultrasound. He was a doctor. Uh, radiology, that means fixing radios. Okay, I'm just kidding. That's dad humor from, from dad, another dad here. But what my dad would notice is that um, his, his business would pick up a lot during recessions. You know, a lot of doctors' businesses do for whatever reason. So, you know, healthcare is somewhat countercyclical. Outsourcing can be thought of as somewhat countercyclical as well, as big companies, when they restructure uh, in bad economic environments, might decide to outsource more job roles instead of hiring more people. Okay, so, and there are other ones too, like consumer staples, like Campbell's Soup. Soup is good food. You know, I used to invest in CPB, or I think that's the ticker, CPB, Campbell Soup, uh, in recessions because that stock wouldn't go down as much when I managed my hedge fund. It's a, it's a staple. People are going to buy food no matter what the economy is. Okay. All right. Next question is, hold on a second. Um, from Phyllis. Hey, Phyllis. Hummingbird lady. I must sign out. 12 new mind time uh, and, and commitments. Uh, your viewers ask highly insightful questions. I love my viewers. I rock. Uh, thanks for your time. Appreciate it. Thank you, Phyllis. And thank you, everybody on this call, too. Okay. Um, the shadow, it's just, it's its killing me here. Uh, hopefully it doesn't bother you guys as much, but whatever. All right. Next up, that's what happens when you're a perfectionist. It's not a good thing. Okay. Uh, uh, Logan101 uh, is saying, um, I, I want to thank you, sir. I saw your video. Thank you. Um, I saw your video on how to be yourself and not caring, worrying in a job interview. Uh, I didn't get uh, the job, uh, but but was uh, the least stressful interview I've ever had. Thank you for that. Thank you for that. And, it, and it's, it's so interesting you say that uh, because today at, at 11 a.m. Uh, San Francisco time, uh, my vlog is going to drop, which means it's going to get published. That's what younger folks say. I'm not young. I'm trying to whatever. Uh, my vlog today is going to be published at 11 a.m. is uh, on how to interview. Three great tips on, on how to interview. And I actually, uh, Dante, you'll like it because, uh, or whoever asked the question, I'm sorry about consulting. Uh, you'll like it because uh, I talk about consulting interviews and the Boston Consulting Group and why I fill my BCG interview. And I think that watching that vlog today uh, will really help you um, to interview better. Interview better. So um, it, there's a couple of great tips there. And you can always take my complete job course if, if you want. Um, and I promise you that you will, you will get the job of your dreams if you follow all my steps in that course eventually. I promise you. I like it. So is that Logan or, or Login? Sorry. Logan's Run was a great movie. If you guys get a chance, watch that one. It's an oldie, but a goodie. All right, Jason. Uh, good day, Chris. Oh, yeah, you're from Australia, right? Awesome. Awesome. I always smile whenever I think of the Australian accent. And actually, and I mentioned this last week, in, in Siri, I only use the Australian accent because Australians always sound like they're smiling when they're, when they're talking. Hey, Siri, what time is it? It's 9.36 a.m. See? Doesn't she sound like she's smiling? There's a guy, too, you can do for Siri there. All right. All right. Good day, Chris. Uh, good day, Jason. Um, I'm thinking of Foster's beer now for some reason. I've done several technical deep dive calls for my company's uh, venture capital investment group. It was great fun. What type of roles exist out there for this and what skills are key to it? Okay. So I, I think that, um, and as with all my answers, I make them generic enough so it applies to everybody. I think that having deep analytical skills and frameworks is something that can make you very marketable, regardless of what industry you work in. And so what I want you to do, and all of you to do, is after every course you took in school, if it's a business course, or after every course you've taken of mine or other people online on Udemy, I want you to think of what frameworks did I learn? What frameworks can I use? What frameworks can I use to analyze business problems? And the more simplistic ones include the SWOT analysis, S-W-O-T, which is strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. You also have the Boston Consulting Group matrix. You have the product lifecycle matrix. And I discussed that one in my vlog that's going to drop, say, at 11 a.m. And so I think that having analytical frameworks in place will help you out tremendously, regardless of whether you work in venture capital or other sectors. In addition, being able to create financial models and understand financial modeling is also a plus. Because frameworks, like I mentioned before, will help you with the qualitative analysis side. What about the quantitative side? Well, with the quantitative side, quite often creating a financial model will help you to understand what percent of the total addressable market you get, might get longer term. And in my complete business plan course, I teach you how to use many different qualitative financial model, or qualitative models 
qualitative frameworks. Let me start again there. In my fin- in my complete business plan course, I teach you how to use a number of different qualitative frameworks as well as how to create a financial model from scratch. I also teach it in my other finance courses. So regardless of what industry you're in, when you're analyzing companies, use qualitative frameworks and financial modeling-based frameworks as well. They're all easy to understand and use. And they're amazing if you're in an interview and you need a crutch or something to fall back on. Okay. All right, next up is, I like the trailers of your videos like the MBA program and speech course. Um, how do you make those trailers? Uh, how much did it cost in shooting and editing? Thank you for that question. Uh, so what I did was this. Um, the, the entire MBA one I, I made myself um, in, on, on a, a shoestring budget. Uh, I just got a, a green sheet behind me. Uh, and then what I did in the green sheet, it was it, that's, a, that's painted on the wall, the green there. Uh, but what, what I did was when I, when I made it, I actually had it um, a, a sheet that, that was hanging there uh, in my bedroom. Um, and then I, I put up um, in my entire MBA trailer, remember there's the scene over the, the Golden Gate Bridge. Uh, I just got video in the background. That, that what I was not hanging from a helicopter. A lot of people think that, but it just that's not what happened. Just kidding. Uh, and then when, when it came to the, uh, t- to the other ones, um, what, what I did was uh, I hired a, a guy named Adad Warda. Uh, and Adad is amazing. Um, and um, he went to San Francisco State. I love San Francisco State, my favorite school ever. That's where Wrigley went as well. I used to teach there. Uh, and what, what Adad did uh, was he put together a, a team of, of these brilliant uh, film veterans. Uh, there's six or seven of them, including people that worked on Morgan Freeman's uh, latest movies, a sound editor, et cetera. Uh, and then what happened was um, for the, um, actually, I want to, let me quickly talk about the anatomy of creating a video like that. Okay, and I've learned a lot and I'm starting to do a lot of my own. I bought a drone I've been using as well. It, I'm sort of good at it, but not yet. So when you do these things, if you hire a crew, it is costly. It is costly, but uh, it was a long-term investment. Um, when, when you're making a video, it's so complicated. But I've learned a lot. There's one person, all that person does is sound and background sound too, right? They, they hold this big mic thing for background sounds. Another person, all that person does is focus. They have a separate monitor on the side and they focus, right? Autofocus is not something that professionals like to use. I like to use it. Professionals don't. Then there's another person uh, that was holding the camera on on this gimbal thing. It was a very heavy camera too. So every time we had to do a retake, poor guy, he rolled his eyes (laughs) because I messed up a lot. Then you had a director and that director was a dad. And uh, they would go, take one. And the reason they say take one like that is because sound and video is always recorded separately. And later on, when you go into post edit or you're editing the video, kind of like people use iMovie 4 and other programs, what they want to do is when they import the sound, they want to be able to match up when they saw that, that clapping thing. Okay. And then there's another person that does lighting. And so what we did was... In one of the scenes, in, and if you get a chance, watch the, um, actually, what I'm going to do right now, I'm going to walk you through it because I think it's interesting. And this will teach you all about, about film as, as well as we go through this. So what I'll do is I will go here uh, and I'll make myself smaller and we'll go through the, the anatomy of, of, of this setup. All right. So let, let's go to uh, my, my page here. Um, I'm going to go down to my presentation course, open it. Uh, in uh, a, a new tab. I think I have to actually go into um, private mode for that. Hold on a second. So sorry. New private window. If I'm going to show it to you. Sorry. So we're going to go here together uh, and, and I'm going to show you how it's done. Okay. But there's actually naked people in one scene. Uh, and, and I want to see if you can see it. It's very, very embarrassing. I don't even know how to get there. Go to here. Communications, I guess. Okay, so Wrigley, I asked him earlier, how's the focus? And he said, he wrote this, exactly. He wrote, focused, but focus. Okay, I will focus. This is me focusing. Okay, squirrel. All right, so here's my my course here, okay? So if if we look at this trailer together, um, and I'll make sure there's no sound. uh, But what we did here was, um, this was San Francisco State University. And uh, I'm going to make sure it's muted here. And what happened was, this is one of the classrooms I taught in, 
And I was talking here to my son. You don't know that yet, but I was saying one speech can change your life. And I said, oh, hey there. And he walked in the room. Uh, and I said, I'm just practicing my speech. Do you want to hear it? Okay, great. Let me rehearse it with you. And what happened, you can see I've got makeup on there too, which you have to put on when you're, you're shooting, whatever. I, I put on makeup today as well. You have to because the bright lights, but you become shiny. And so what I do, and I'll fast forward through, through that. Um, what we did here was um, we rented the Castro Theater, okay? And that's a theater uh, in San Francisco. And we rented it early in the morning. It's cheaper doing it that way, early in the morning. And then here you had a guy holding a light, another guy holding a light up top. Uh, and then you had, um, obviously, the camera behind me. I had a little lavalier microphone uh, hidden underneath here. It actually looks like this. Uh, and I always record a couple different versions of audio in case one audio goes down. Okay. Now, what happened was um, um, here. <laughs> all right, right here. Let's see if you can see naked people. This is crazy, okay? Um, but if, if you look here, I'm going to play it. This was on uh, the beach. We had to get a permit to film on the beach here, actually. Uh, the reason I'm... See, right there. Right there. On that side there. You see that person? That person is naked. And I kept cracking up. And we had to do a million different video shoots. Uh, because what happened was... Um, <laughs> it was naked day at the beach. San Francisco's quite a place. It's a little different. It was naked day at the beach. And I know. In San Francisco. It's crazy. And so I had to walk always positioning myself one way. Because there's certain naked people I'm hiding. Uh, and I kept cracking up, right? Uh, and, it, and it was windy as well. Uh, so I'm kind of hiding that person. Um, but that, that kind of sums it up there. And then here's back in the classroom. And then in post-edit, uh, what happened was, um, you know, I hate theory. And Dodd, when he was editing, he put the, uh, the background words and stuff here. So let me fast forward to the end here. Uh, and these are all the books you get in the course for free. Uh, not for free, you pay for the course. And then I said, how is that? And this is my son, Dylan. He was saying, it's okay, I guess. And then he said, can we go home now? And I say, sure thing, bud. And at the end, I say, I have to take him home, but I'll see you in class. Thanks. And then I walk out and a dad put in background noise of, of me talking. Looks like the window or the, the door just slammed shut there because of the wind. Uh, so anyway, that, that's the anatomy of, of doing that. Um, they are a bit costly, but I promise you, 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 you break even on them pretty quickly. If you create good content from, from your heart, from your heart, always. So let me just clear these layers. Clear all this stuff here. Clear, clear, clear. Hold on. And then we'll go back. Okay, we're good to go. All right, great. So anyway, that is one of my uh, trailers. Um, and I did that one in 2017. And then earlier, or last year, I, I flew to Prague twice and I filmed seven or eight more, uh, including the complete cryptocurrency course. Uh, I was very sick then. And so we had to actually dub my voice talking over top. Um, and then there's other ones like the complete job course. Uh, we rented a bus. We, we did a bunch of other amazing stuff. Oh, one thing I'll say is when you're using drones to record videos, um, just be careful because drones will stop working in certain parts of cities. And so we had this beautiful scene in front of the most gorgeous bridge ever. And in that scene, the drone came up to me and I said, you know, when you take my course, the sky is not the limit and the drone was supposed to fly up, but the drone stopped working. It didn't fall into the river. It just stopped working and stayed in one place. Because what happens is when you use drones, there's GPS software embedded, which basically uh, it allow, sets it up so that governments don't let you fly a drone close to any building, which is the right call. So anyway, a little bit too much information there on, on my whole filming progress. If, if you have follow-up questions there, uh, please, uh, please let me know. Thanks. All right, next one, I've got a, a question from uh, Juan David. Hey, Juan, Juan how are you? I uh, hope you're well as well. Uh, I'm in high school right now. Cool. And my goal is to get, my goal is to get into Stanford or to a great Ivy League school. My grades are not very great, nor my SAT or my ACT. Sounds just like me. Um, however, my story, as you said earlier in earlier videos, is something that is very, that very few people have. Any advice? Also advice on improving grades. Thanks a lot, Chris. Okay, cool. Thanks for asking that. So in business and with education, and with anything in life, you always have to think in terms of what is the customer or the uh, admissions director thinking? What is their criteria? Think like they do. They're usually trying to diversify in, when it comes to admissions directors, this, the, the student body. And so what I want you to do is I want you to list skills that you have that nobody else has or experiences you have in your life that nobody else has. 
So when I applied to, uh, to business school, for example, I went on exchange in Cuba at the University of Havana Faculty of Economics. And at that time, uh, Americans were not allowed to go to Cuba. So I knew that differentiated me. And my grades were not that great when I first started university because I don't know why I was distracted my first semester. And I ended up actually in, in the hospital after my first semester at university uh, with mono. And that's a good thing. And I'll tell you why. And I always see the positives and everything. I'm a little naive. But it's a good thing because um, I didn't take any of my exams. Right? I had to take my courses again from scratch. I would have failed all my exams anyway. Um, but what happened was my grades went up over time. And my last year, I did very, very well. My last two years, close to a 4 but my first two years were pretty bad. Okay, so the, what, what I did to beef up my resume was um, I did well towards the end uh, in school. And I also was president of a lot of things, yearbook, my fraternity, magazines, whatever, all that good stuff. So I want you to do the same thing. I want you to be presidents of clubs. I want you to start clubs as well. And I want you to watch uh, a video I have on how to get into Stanford uh, or an Ivy League school. And I posted that video for you, I think it was just before Christmas. So go to my vlog and watch that one and that will help you out tremendously. Thank you for the question. All right, next question is, uh, Lamarck is, uh, oh, you're welcome. Thanks, Lamarck. Following you is one of the best things that has happened uh, to me last quarter in 2018. Thank you, I appreciate that, thank you. Um, I think I found my passion. It's in business and finance. Thank you for that, man, God bless you. I want to learn from you more. Thank you. Um, I, I took five-year courses. Are you planning to make a course about venture capital as a whole? Thank you for that question. So I do have a course on venture capital, but it's very, very bad. Don't take it. Okay. Uh, it's, it's one of my earlier ones. I'm probably going to unpublish it. Um, it. And it was kind of when I was trying to figure out how to make a course. And the problem with that course was there aren't really skills for you to learn from it. It was kind of just informational. And when people take courses, they want to learn tangible skills that they can implement. So I will make a new venture capital course eventually. Um, but what you can do is if you want to learn more about the history of venture capital, just watch the trailer of that course. Don't buy it. Um, but I will make a venture capital course at some point. But um, if you want to learn more about venture capital and how venture capital analysts and investors uh, approach investments, then take my uh, complete financial analyst training and investing course. Thanks. Okay. Um, <laughs> okay. I, I got uh, a comment here saying, I, I, I want to be uh, Vladimir Putin. <clears throat> okay. I, I don't know where the question is there. That's okay. And I'm actually, I, I published a vlog uh, this, this, this Friday that's going to be a little bit critical of something about that. Um, I, I hope people that are big Putin fans aren't, aren't, aren't uh, upset by that. But anyway, I, I, I pre-published it already. It's coming out this Friday. You'll see. And I love Russians, though. I have lots of Russian friends. All right, next question is, and give me a second. I'm just going to open the door so I can get some more cool air in here. This bright light close to me is burning me up. All right, I am back. All right, next up. Thoughts on the annual shareholder meetings? Are they worth it? Uh, I want to attend McDonald's and uh, United Airlines one. Yeah, so you can attend any shareholder meeting you want. And there's a vlog I published uh, called How to Get a Meeting with Any CEO You Want. And the crux of that vlog, the bottom line, is that anybody can go to shareholder meetings. And that's how you meet CEOs. And don't ever try to sell your product to somebody in a company if it's not the right person. Go right to the top. You got nothing to lose. And everything to gain. So anyway, yes, go to shareholder meetings if, if you can, because it's a great way for you to network and get to know CEOs. And those CEOs will not leave those events until everybody has, because the board is watching, the board of directors, and other employees are watching them as well. So go up and ask them questions at the end and talk to them as long as you want to. You got nothing to lose and everything to gain, meaning a job, an interview, whatever, a follow-up with someone else within the company, that sort of thing. All right, next up. All right, I've got a question on um, uh, which has, uh, and there's not that many questions left, so I'm going to end the call uh, when, when there's no more questions uh, left in the call. So please think of your questions now and, and type them. Thanks. All right, uh, and, and I'm very sorry about the, the technical difficulty with, with this light here. I'll fix it next week. I'm getting better, sort of. 
All right. So next question is from Kardec, which is, uh, which has a wider scope, finance or accounting? I like accounting, but I'm not sure whether I will have much scope five years from now. Okay. Okay. So what is the difference between accounting and finance? So accounting is more of a science because it's backwards looking. And you have to be precise and very, very accurate. Okay. And it's backwards looking. Finance is more of an art. You're forward thinking. You're forward looking. You have to be comfortable with uncertainty. You're predicting the future. You have a crystal ball. And so the difference there is also that if you work in finance, you have to be comfortable with uncertainty and knowing that you're going to be a little bit wrong, more than a little bit sometimes. You know, if you can create a financial model and pick a stock price within 10%, that's amazing. But you're going to be 10% off. So I would say the big difference between finance and accounting, the bottom line is finance is less precise. It's more of an art and accounting is more of a science and it's very much more precise. Thank you. All right. But the bottom line there, dude, also is do what you're passionate about. You know, if accounting bores you to tears, don't do it. If finance is exciting to you, then do it. That sort of thing. All right. Next question I've got is. Chris, where do you think the world is going? Like AI or the digital era? What are your opinions on that? The way you teach finance is great. Uh, I think I learned a lot here. Thank you. Thank you. And you'll like a vlog I published around Christmas Day, uh, which is called um, uh, What Finance Roles um, Are Going to Be Big in the Future. Uh, so watch that vlog if you get a chance. But the bottom line there uh, is that whenever I look at roles or technologies or any business model or product or service, I always ask myself one question, which is this. In five years from now, is this product or service or company or role going to be more relevant or less relevant? And so when it comes to your question with artificial intelligence um, based uh, roles, in five years, yeah, absolutely. AI is going to be a big deal, a bigger deal. You know, go on to Udemy and take courses by a guy named Kirill. He's amazing. He teaches data science and artificial intelligence-based courses. He's awesome. But yes, it's going to be much more relevant in five years. And I do that with all companies I look to invest in. Like BlackBerry, my beloved research in motion in Canada. I'm Canadian. Um, you know, you could ask, a couple of years ago, you could ask yourself, in five years, are people going to use more Blackberries or less or fewer? My English is not great. Fewer Blackberries. You could ask yourself years ago, in five years, are people going to use Yahoo or Google? You know, in five years from now, are people going to use more Bing or more Google? More Google, obviously, unless you work at Microsoft. Okay. No disrespect to Microsoft. Sort of. All right. Um, let's see. Yeah, but but in general, in terms of predicting the future. Oh, watch, watch a vlog I, I created, actually, on um, tech trends of the future to bet on. Uh, and, and I answer that question in more detail, but I'll, I'll give you one little snippet from it, which is this. I believe that the best investments in Houston, in, in Houston, in Houston, in history <laughs> are platforms. You know, um, the best investments historically have been platforms. Facebook is the quintessential social media platform. LinkedIn is an HR platform. Um, Apple uh, and, and iOS is, is, is a platform as well for, for buying apps. So when I think of when I think of technology that's going to be relevant in the future, I think of platforms. You know, the, the, the future platforms are going to be voice, which basically is now, the future is now, voice is big now, it's going to get bigger. Why do you have to see, feel, or touch your operating system? And I also believe that virtual reality is going to be a massive platform. And there's a reason why Oculus was purchased by Facebook. There's a reason why uh, Microsoft has HoloLens. There's a reason why Google is experimenting with uh, VR technologies as well. Everybody's getting into this, Sony as well. I've got a, a, a PlayStation 4 uh, VR headset and I don't play the games anymore. I actually watch YouTube videos that are 360. And you can go to YouTube and do a search for 360 and then any topic or virtual reality and any topic. And my son, my son loves the Titanic. And so we loved what playing going on, going on a roller coaster on the Titanic over YouTube. There's a VR video for that. VR is the future. You do get a little bit of motion sickness at times. Uh, they've got to find a way to, to, to fix that. But once you put them on, man, you never want to take them off. You never want to take them off. They're amazing. They're amazing. All right. Um, 
Next up, um, I, I've got, um, and, and somebody asked a, a question here also on where's the world going. Um, if, if that's from a non-tech perspective, if you're curious about China longer term, um, I'm publishing a vlog on that this, this Friday. It, it's going to be a little bit uh, controversial. Uh, the, the title of the vlog is Trump. No, it's China plus Trump plus taxes. That's a little teaser for you there. Uh, I thought twice about publishing it, but anyway, it's this Friday uh, at, at 11 a.m. If you're watching the replay of this, uh, it'll be um, Friday, January, um, actually tomorrow, uh, 18th. Okay. All right, next question I've got is, uh, can you recommend a book or a course on professional services management? So I have a couple of management courses. One is called um, How to Manage by Delegating, uh, which is great for professional services because the more you delegate when you work in consulting or services, the more productive you can be longer term. And another course I created that goes hand in hand with that one is called How to Motivate Employees, which is crucial when it comes to professional services as well. In terms of other topics on that, um, I, I don't know if you're looking for something more specific. Um, maybe search um, search Amazon uh, for services or consulting books, that sort of thing, or whatever industry you're looking into. And the dummies books are great, by the way. You know, the, 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 you know, learn Visual Basic for dummies or, or, or Python for dummies. I think they're fantastic because they simplify the process. Um, so you, you can look there as well. You can also go to Udemy and just do searches on courses in, in a services sector, it might be of interest to you. Now, when it comes to creating a business model from scratch on a services company, you can take my course called the Complete Business Plan course, where I walk you through how to launch a company, how to create a business plan from scratch, and how to model a company, how to create financials from scratch, even if you have no experience in that area. And when I teach you how to model, I teach you how to model for a products company and a services-based company, meaning billable hours, that sort of thing. Okay. All right, next up is from Lamarck. Uh, if you invest uh, in a startup uh, as an investor, what is your primary role? Uh, let's say you agree to own 10 to 20% of the company. Do you make decisions? Do you plan advice, et cetera? Okay, so usually no. However, if you invest a lot of money in a startup, you usually get a board seat. You get to sit on the board because you have a fiduciary duty to your investors yourself or to yourself, your, your own um, net worth, to understand what's going on in that company. And board meetings usually take, pay, take, pace, take place. Pace is a great university in New York. Uh, board meetings usually take place um, every, every three months. And so what, what I recommend doing is go to my vlog and do a search on my vlog for the word board meetings because I explain what board meetings are from scratch. And during these board meetings, what happens is uh, the founder of the company or the CEO, she or he tells the board members how things are progressing. And the board will offer advice if they're asked for advice. And the board will help uh, the company um, by adding value if they can. You know, I think that the best board members are the ones that get the first call from the founder if something goes wrong. And so when I sit on boards, and I've been on many boards in the past, I don't talk unless I have value to add. I don't speak in meetings unless I have value to add. I'm not one of those people that likes the sound of my voice, although I am talking a lot today. My voice sounds okay today, right? Right, Wrigley? But I only offer advice um, if I'm asked or if I think I have something that's gonna help the company grow, like introduce a new customer, that sort of thing. Don't let your board members run your company. And if you meet with an investor and your gut tells you not to trust them, then don't trust them, okay? And don't bring them on board, okay? Because uh, a bad investor on your board is, is worse than a divorce because divorce can, can occur. It's bad, but it can occur. But these shareholders are with you forever. So just be careful, be careful, okay? All right, uh, next one um, I've got, hold on, I've got a text there. All right, just got an activity alert in my house just so I have that. We have the, the cleaning person upstairs. Sorry about the, the noise there. All right, um, next question I've got is, um, oh, and, and, and Lamarck, I, I, I created a vlog, um, I think it was yesterday, on um, how to raise money or how much money should you raise. Please watch that one, okay? It'll help you. All right, next one is from Paul. Good morning, Paul. How are you? I'm great, thanks. Um, how uh, will your next MBA work? Okay, so I'm creating a, 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 an MBA program, a degree program uh, online. 
Uh, how will it work? Uh, will it be an extended version of your Udemy courses? Uh, it's an amazing course. Um, uh, it, you wrote here, it is an amazing course and the first look I took on you. Okay, thanks. Okay, thanks for that. Um, so, yeah, so I'm, I'm working on it now. I'm working very hard on it. It's not going to come out until the fall. Um, but the way it's going to work, uh, and I'm not going to release all the information yet, uh, but I've, I've received a lot of feedback from a lot of my students on stuff to include. And students have told me that they want me to include an incubator part to the program as well, where I help you create your company from scratch, okay, which, which will be a lot of fun. In terms of overlap with Udemy courses, no. Um, but there's going to be some Udemy courses that are going to be prerequisites. And so you have to take them on Udemy. And then what you do is when you finish those courses, you can then send uh, the, uh, their certificate of completion from Udemy. Okay? And once you've completed those courses, uh, you'll get credit towards the MBA program. We're going to teach different stuff in the MBA program. I'm, I'm going all out by creating a, a state-of-the-art, uh, I want to show you here, a green screen room. Uh, you can see I, I painted the floor. the, the like it, it's, I've got a massive wide-angle lens I'm not using right now. Uh, and it's going to look and feel like CNBC meets Harvard Business School. But HBS, two-thirds of HBS is BS. My program will not be. It, it'll be a lot of fun. It, a lot of it's going to be uh, somewhat case-oriented. There's going to be no theory. Uh, I'm going to teach you stuff that you've never uh, learned before in school that you should have learned in an MBA program, uh, like you know how to get a job, um, you know how to interview, how to get any customer, how to get a meeting with anybody, um, as, as well as how to create um, more advanced financial statements, um, and, and how to create a company and how to present better than anybody. I'm going to watch you present. I'm going to teach you how to present like a freaking rock star. Okay? I'm going to teach you how to sell as well. And all those aforementioned concepts are not taught in business schools, which is ridiculous. Okay? And so I've got a lot of experience in different industries. I'm going to bring all that to the table to humbly help you um, excel in, in life and in business and be much more successful than people that have MBAs from any school on the planet. And I'm putting my reputation on the line. It's going to happen. It's going to happen. So, and it'll be a lot of fun as well. In terms of accreditation, no, I refuse to be subjected to any board or any group or any government. I refuse to include content that they want me to include. I refuse to include theory and live by their rules. Okay, this is for you. You're the student, you're the customer. The customer is always right. You're the only customer. I'm not appe appealing to or appeasing different government agencies. I'm not a .edu. I looked into it, um, but I don't want to be stuck teaching certain things. I want to teach you whatever the heck it takes to make you extraordinarily successful. Okay, it's going to be very selective to get in. I'm going to keep it small uh, initially um, because I am going to train all of you one-on-one -on -one and make you incredibly competitive in the real world and more competitive than any MBA from any school ever. Okay, and I'm very focused and motivated to make this happen. In terms of how long will it take to complete, it'll probably take anywhere between six months and three years. You decide. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to put the courses online and I'm going to teach them also multiple times daily in different time zones. So that if you're overseas, I teach you live as well and I take your questions live as well. Okay. Uh, it's going to be much more interactive than this is as well. And the reason I said between six months and three years is I don't know your schedule. You know, every customer is different and the customer is always right. I want to appeal to you if you want to do it full time for six months and get it out of the way. Or if you're working full time and you have a family and you want to do it over three years, there's going to be options for everybody. I'll have more clarity and, and more information on that uh, as we get closer to release date. Um, if you want, you can go to my website uh, and there's a link uh, where you can sign up to receive more information when it's available. And if you can also, if you want, please provide me with advice on what you want me to include uh, in that MBA program because you are the customer and the customer is always right. Okay. All right. Uh, oh, thanks, Lamarck. Have a good day, dude. See ya. All right. So, um, uh, Mr. Nitro, Dave, how are you, bud? Dave uh, is... Uh, He's great. Uh, his, his wife actually is, is from my hometown or where I used to live in Bramalee or Brampton in Canada. Uh, and, and Dave actually sent me, uh, we never actually met, love to meet you one day, Dave. One day I'm going to do one of these calls uh, in person with everybody. And I have, I'll have a studio here so you, a bunch of people can come. 
But uh, Tim Hortons is a great coffee product in Canada. And uh, Dave sent this to me along with a lot of great uh, Canadian candy bars. Thank you for that, Dave. I appreciate it. Uh, and Dave's name is Mr. Nitro uh, because he, he is an expert in the chemical industry. Great. So uh, great to hear from you, Dave. Uh, loved your book that you published uh, on, uh, on Amazon. And I hope you and your family are doing well as well. Thank you for that. All right. Um, and so Geronimo, how are you? All right, so Geronimo is saying, uh, hello, Chris. Uh, good afternoon from uh, Brazil. I love Brazil. Rio is now my favorite city in the world. It used to be Barcelona. Rio is so beautiful. I loved it. I loved it. And, and I gave a speech there, actually. And if anyone's interested in watching it, that speech on the future of education and what I'm all, all about, that's Canadian for a boat, what I'm all about, right, Dave Nitro? Uh, you can go to my vlog and just watch the Brazil speech at the top there. Okay, great. Uh, and so have I used uh, OKRs? meaning objective key results uh, in my personal life or business life. What is the best techniques to meet your goals uh, in, in your opinion? So um, I, I don't know what that term means. I've heard of uh, key success factors or KSF, key success factors. I've heard of different acronyms. But what I do actually is every single day, um, I, I create um, my to-do list for the next day. Uh, and it's a schedule I create. Uh, if you want to get a, a copy of the schedule I use and, and customize it yourself, uh, you can do one of two things. Number one is go to my vlog and search for a video on how to be more productive. Or number two, go to my website and download the form that I use to fill out every day so you can customize it. And that web address is this all lowercase. haroonventures.com slash schedule, all lowercase. Or schedule if you're from England. Okay, still spelled S-C-H-E-D-U-L-E, schedule, yeah. All right, next up I've got is from uh, from Dave. Uh, Dave is saying, do I have any experience with drop with drop shipping? And if so, any advice? Uh, thank you. Uh, thanks for the question, buddy. Um, so I, I don't. And so I've had this question before and, and I don't like giving advice on, on stuff that I, I haven't really had much experience in. If you do a search on Udemy on drop shipping, I'm sure there's plenty of great courses. Um, it, when it comes to um, buying and selling products online, I've done it a bunch. Uh, and you can go online uh, to, to YouTube and watch a, a vlog I had on this uh, called you have, You're Worth Thousands of Dollars More Than You Think or You Have Thousands of Dollars More Than You Think You Do in the Attic of Your House. Um, but what I've done is I've bought from AliExpress.com. That's Alibaba's website in China. I bought a lot of products uh, and, I, and I've sold them online. And so what my sons and I did was we would buy hundreds of cases, iPhone and Android cases, at a very low price. And then we sell them over eBay and we made a hefty, nice profit. But after a while, we got stuck with inventory. So what I'll say to you is make sure that you don't have to ever take on any inventory because what kills companies a lot of times is too much inventory. It actually bankrupted the entire video game industry back in the 80s. Atari went belly up because of a video game called E.T., which they made too many of, which destroyed uh, the entire uh, video game industry. So be careful with, in, uh, with, um, uh, with, with inventory. Um, Anyway, um, let's see what, what's, what's next. And, and so use just in time as well. Only buy the stuff right before you need it. And actually, if you, if you, ever, if you ever bought uh, one of my books on, on, um, uh, on Amazon, uh, what I want you to do is go to the last page. And um, you'll, you'll see, and, and Dave, you'll actually see it on your book, which you published on Amazon, which I love. It's fantastic. Um, but what you'll see is on the last page of your book and my books and everyone's books that published on Amazon, you'll see the date that the book was printed and where it was printed, usually in San Bernardino or in other places close to where you live. It's the birth date. And a lot of times when you order books on Amazon, they haven't been printed yet, but you still get them one and a half days later. I want you to think of inventory the same way, just in time inventory. Okay. All right. Next up, uh, Geronimo has got a question. Um, what are my thoughts on minimum viable product, which is people call MVP? Uh, can you transfer that technique to apply in your life, like minimal viable habits? Yeah, um, that's an interesting question. So, so for those of you that aren't familiar with minimum viable product or an MVP, it basically means make a product that's not perfect, but put it out in the market and test it. Just get it out there and then improve it in real time until it is less than viable. It's a great product. Okay, so uh, it's, it's kind of like crowdsourcing, how you get people to kind of help you make your product or finance it, that sort of thing. And a lot of people will use wireframing uh, when it comes to uh, technology. They'll kind of design uh, what an app might look like uh, for, for an iPhone or Android handset using wireframing software, just basic drag and drop stuff. 
uh, and then it'll re release the product when it's kind of ready, but not perfect. I I'm a big proponent of, I love uh, the minimum viable product approach because what happens is technology changes so quickly and you got to get your product out there. And if you're a perfectionist, which is one of my biggest uh, problems in life, if you're like you've seen today when I try to get the lighting perfect, which I didn't, whatever. Uh, but actually, it kind of covers up my acne on this side here, right? <laughs> uh, but it, it, you got to get your product out, even if it's not perfect. Like, like oh, for videos, YouTube videos. If you create videos online uh, or Udemy courses, don't make them perfect. Just get it out there. Get it out there. Yes, you can edit it a bit. But if you have an um or an ah every now and then, who cares, man? Just, just get it out there. Get it out there. So I'm a big fan of that. In terms of applying that technique uh, to my life, um, I, I guess... You know, when one teaches to learn, um, you know, one of my biggest problems is trying to be a perfectionist. You know, every video I release, I try to make the music perfect, everything perfect. Uh, and sometimes I, I suffer because of that. You know, other aspects of my life could be enhanced because of that. So I would say that um, the best way to answer that euphemism for uh, the antithesis of, of minimum viable habits uh, or whatever it is in, in your life is just to not be a perfectionist. That would, that's what I would say. And as always, write down your goals. And you can always go and check out my, my goal setting workshops uh, by searching my blog on, on, on the word goal. Okay, great. All right, I don't see too many more questions. So if you have a question, please write it down now. Uh, thanks. All right, next up is how do I decide what to study uh, in college? Uh, I want to chase my dreams and not money as you say. Thank you so much. I just got, I just go by Juan David, uh, by the way. Okay, great. Thank you. Okay, so I called you Juan before. So Juan David, uh, can I call you JD? We're not we're not that close buddies yet. But Tony, Tony two times, who's usually on these calls, he lets me call him T. All right, Juan David, sorry. Uh, so Juan David, um, study what you're passionate about. And the worst thing you could possibly do in your life is to live your life for somebody else, um, to study something that your parents want you to study. You know, don't live your life to please them or anybody else. Obviously, be very respectful to your parents. I believe in that. It's one of the Ten Commandments. But live your life on your terms by choosing your own profession. Otherwise, what happens is you're going to be so unhappy. So unhappy the rest of your life. You know, if, if and I've been there, man. I, I remember, I remember when I was a kid. I remember laughing so hard until it hurt. And then I started working. And I hated what I was doing. And I changed careers. And I changed careers again. And I still hated it. And I wasn't laughing as much in life. And then I said, screw it. I I'm just going to chase my dreams. And I went after this, you know, teaching, which I love doing. And I laugh a lot in life now. I'm enjoying my life. So I want you to do what you're most passionate about in life. You know, if you, if you, chase, if you chase money, you'll lose your dreams and your money. If you chase your dreams, as I mentioned before, your dreams will come true if you fail a bunch. And I want you to fail. And I want you to embrace failure. Failure is cool. And I encourage my kids to take risks and fail. I love it because you'll never get anywhere in life if you don't take risks. But I want you to follow your heart and follow your passion and do what you want to do most in life. You know, Mark Twain had a great quote, which is the two most important days in your life are number one, the day you're born, and number two, the day you find out why. What is your raison d'être? You know, what is your passion? You know, what, what, what do you do during, um, during the weekend? That should be what you do full time, okay? Do what you love doing and you'll be incredibly successful and you'll never have a job for the rest of your life. You'll have a passion. All right, next up is, how was that delivery by the way? Was that, was that Oscar worthy or, or not? And actually the reason I have this and a lot of you are gonna think I'm an idiot. Uh, the, re the reason I have this is, um, my goal is I want to get an Oscar award one day for best business documentary. I have no idea what I'm doing. You can see that this, this, this room, oh, that got in the way there. Sorry, it's gone now. My setup is not perfect. I'm, I'm learning a lot. It's a minimum viable product, I guess. It's getting better. Uh, but um, I want you to all set goals as well and vocalize your goals and visualize them too. Like remember when you were a kid, you had a picture of your car on your, on your wall. You know, that's a goal. I want you to put goals on your walls too. And so, and, and I showed this last week at the beginning of, of the vlog. These are the goals uh, for my, my son, Dylan, uh, for, for the next year. And they go up on his wall. Uh, actually, I, I took it down. I'll, I'll put it back on his law wall. It, one is 
never lie, be a better listener, read more, write more, and then try to, initially it said, try to stop playing video games. But I don't know if you can see that closely there. I'll try here. Sorry about the green screen issue there. It says, try to keep on playing video games. Um, who am I to tell him what to do? And yeah, I do minimize video games during the week, but you know what, dude? If, if he wants to be a, a gamer in life, let him be a gamer. Why not? Do you know how many successful people in technology uh, are, are video gamers? There's tons of them, man. There's tons of them. Every, and I'm sure that there are people on this call that are coders, and that's your job. You're a programmer, and you love it. And I know you played video games when you're younger, because I did too, and I was a programmer as, as well. As well. So hold on one second. I'm just going to shut the door. I'll be right back. All right. Yeah. So 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 do what you, do what you love doing uh, all, always in life. Okay. All right. It, it's it's killing me that little thing there. But I, I okay. I'm going to try not be a perfectionist. And there's a little black line there on the side. I'm going to leave that there. Okay. Wrigley, this is a test for me. Wrigley works for me. Okay. I'm going to leave that there. Okay. All right. Um, let's see here. All right. Um, I, I got a question. And, and Juan David, I hope that answered your question. Uh, if it didn't, uh, please, please let me know. Um, I want you to do what you're most passionate about in life. Okay. And, and I think that and I'm very different in my approach to education, my thought process. But, but I think that my, my kids are the, the last generation that, that feel like they have to go to school. Uh, they have to get a degree, I mean, from university. I think in the future, people are going to do it online. And I think what's going to happen is university degrees are not going to be four years in the future. They're going to be two. Because, come on, seriously, man. Like, a four-year degree with 13 hours of class a week? Ridiculous. And half the stuff we don't use anyway. I think what happens is we do two-year degrees and then online supplements it. And if you want to learn more about this, watch my speech um, uh, in, in Geronimo. Hopefully you've seen it. It's, I did it in Brazil. Uh, just go to my vlog and you'll see that speech. Um, that little black line there on the side there, it, it is killing me. <laughs> Which side is it here? It's right there. Oh. There. It had to be done, people. It, it had to be done. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm not, I'm not perfect. <laughs> All right. Next up. Uh, and, and Juan David, if I did not answer your question, um, just, just please let me know. And if you don't know what you want to do, right? And a lot of people don't know. Like, I don't put pressure on my kids. What do you want to be in life? You know, maybe do a, if, if you go to college, do a Bachelor of Arts and just take a, a, a mixture of courses. You know, take, um, you know, take a math course. Right. Um, you know, take um, maybe you're passionate about math. I don't know. Take a program course. Take art history. Art history is important. Um, you know, learning about arts is important because it's great boardroom talk. You know, to be able to be, you know, well versed in, in different cultural topics is 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 a beautiful thing. And it's great for interviews, and it's also great for um, just business meetings in general and, and, and a love of sports. Like whenever I meet somebody from a different city in America, I'll always talk about the sports team from their city. If they're from Baltimore, I'll, I'll talk about Cal Ripken, who's an amazing athlete that, that played for the Orioles. You know, if, if I meet somebody from, um, from Madrid, I might talk about uh, Real Madrid. I don't know. Uh, but just know that sports is great boardroom talk. And when you go to college, try to take a lot of courses uh, that will, will kind of help you be more worldly as well. Study a little bit of history, maybe anthropology, just take one course in each uh, in, in each of those aforementioned uh, buckets until you find something you're passionate about. So anyway, all right. Next question I've got is um, somebody saying hello, sir. Please call call me Chris, or or Haroon or Baboon. My my last name has been called Heroin before. We've been paged. Heroin party of six. Heroin party of six at a restaurant. Don't call me sir. Please call me Chris. Thank thank you though. How do I improve my communication skills to become a leader? And how do I track the progress of this goal? Okay. So the, the best thing to do is, is this. So I, I published a vlog a, a week ago uh, on um, advice for new engineers. Okay. And, and I'm speaking of myself here. And 
when I was a software engineer, I used to program. And I remember that I, you know, 10, 12 hours would go by and I was drinking Jolt Cola, which is like Red Bull. And I was in the zone, dude. And programmers out there, you might know about this 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 feeling uh, like um, uh, 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 Geronimo, your, your coder. Um, so 10 hours go by and I see, I, I hear nothing. I'm coding. I love it. It's like a puzzle. It's like cut the rope or something or, or whatever video game you play. And then the problem with that is this. Because I didn't socialize as much, I got nervous in social settings a little bit. A little bit. You know, especially with senior people. I go to an elevator. I'm like, oh, my God. What do I say? <laughs> nice weather today, sir, isn't it? I wouldn't use sir, though. Or, or, uh, or I, I even meet people that were my level. And I'd be a little bit nervous because I was like, dude, I kind of forget how to communicate as well as I used to. So what I want you to do then uh, in that case is um, I want you to force yourself to socialize a lot. I want you to meet people, have fun, and learn. Get to know people in every department you know, within your company or, or, or every class you take at school or in all aspects of your life. I also want you to start presenting in front of large groups of people. I want you to take my complete presentation course. Okay? It'll teach you how to, how to public speak better than anybody. I put my reputation on the line there. And I used to be terrified of public speaking, which is you'll, you'll learn about just by watching the promotional video we, we talked about earlier for that course. I used to be terrified, but I ran to my fears, man. I ran to my fears. And I went into the prison system here in Redwood City. It's called the McGuire Correctional Facility. I went in there and I used to give speeches you know, in front of these poor kids, usually 20-year-old guys with a deadbeat father. There's no such thing as a deadbeat mother. I go in there. And I, yeah, I, I give speeches and I ran to my fear and I conquered it. I want you to run to your fear too as well when it comes to presenting, if, if you're fearful of it. I want you to also go to meetup.com, wherever you are in the world. I want you to go to meetup.com and enter your city name and then search for public speaking or what's called Toastmasters. Search for those keywords. And I want you to go to those free meetup events and there's a meetup for just about everything. And I want you to force yourself to present a lot, okay? And I also want you to tell yourself one thing for the rest of your life, which is this. I don't care what people think about me. And I'm not telling you to be rude or disingenuous. But when you're up there presenting, I want you to tell yourself, I don't care what people think. All right. Uh, and if you get a chance, watch, um, if you go to my vlog, um, there's a, a graduation speech I gave at San Francisco State University uh, where I give all the best advice I can think of. I poured my heart into it. Um, and I talk about David beating Goliath as well. Um, I had a lot of fun with that. I, I wish the audio was better, but watch it, please. Thanks. All right. If you have questions, please enter them now. There's not that many questions left. Thanks. And I'm, I want to stay on this call forever. All right, next up, um, Chris, from a, a teacher's point of view, uh, what should we teach children? And what do you think of the education system? Yeah. So I think one of the most important things you can teach your kids is teach them to be confident. And if they're confident in their abilities, they'll have the confidence to choose their own path in life and not choose a career or a degree that will make you happy, the parents. Teach them to be confident to make their own decisions. You know, teach them to be confident and embrace failure and risk taking. Teach them to maintain their confidence after they fail in life. And encourage them to take risks and fail because they'll never succeed without taking on big risks. Teach them that nobody is smarter than they are. I'm not saying teach them to be arrogant. Just teach them to be confident and to think for themselves. Teach them to live their lives based on their own terms always. And the reason why I bring up confidence, and it's, it's a big deal because it, in business and in life, perception becomes reality. If somebody's very confident when they're selling a product or service to you, mm -hmm. you assume that they're competent. Confidence leads to perceived competence. Nobody is smarter than you. And one thing I'll say about America, and I'm not going to be biased against the rest of the world, um, but I'm going to say what's on my mind right now. So when, when I grew up in Canada uh, back in the 1980s, uh, Reagan Bush, I love Ronald Reagan. That guy was awesome. But I remember back in the 80s, I remember the cover of Time and Newsweek 
was a picture of the American student. And those articles or those issues were titled The Downfall of the American Child or Student. And I hear it every five or six years. People say, this is the downfall of the American student. They're 50th in the world in math. They're 50th in the world in science. They're 50th in the world in whatever. No. People are missing the point. People are missing the point. And I've taught a lot of American students. And what I'm about to say is applicable to whether or not my students were born in America or not. And half my students I teach are outside of America. American students are number one in the world in the most important economic category that nobody talks about, which is confidence. And with confidence comes the ability to sell a dream. With confidence comes the ability to sell something that sounds boring, like cloud software, sound incredibly interesting. With confidence comes the ability to take risks and pick yourself up after failing and try again and again and again. Watch the movie Tucker if you get a chance. It's called uh, Tucker, a story about an American and his dream. It's an amazing movie. And the director and writer was Francis Ford Coppola. You got to see it. It's awesome. It's awesome. But I'd say the bottom line for parents and for managers, you know, with your employees and with your students uh, and, and, and with your children is just to build up their confidence as much as you can. There's nothing more important in business and in life than having a lot of confidence. And confidence is a switch. You can turn it on or off up here. Perception becomes reality. I think, therefore I am. Whether or not you think you can do it, you're right. It's a switch. So switch on that confidence switch and leave it on forever so that you can live your life on your own terms. All right, hopefully that answers that question. My God, I talk a lot. All right. <laughs> All right, next up is from Fred. Hey, Fred, first time I've seen your, your name on the call. Welcome. I hope you can join us again. Thank you. All right, so next question is from Fred. Fred is saying, thank you for your dedication to inspire others. Uh, thank you. I'm a West Point grad. Wow. I'm a West Point grad and former Green Beret, developing a program to help veterans uh, enter into finance careers. Uh, would you be interested in being involved? I transitioned five years ago and, and saw that many veterans are too intimidated to enter the finance world due to their um, lack of exposure. Um, I'd like to educate and empower them to pursue this dream. Good for you, man. Good for you. And, and God bless you for, for, for your service. And, and thank you. Um, wow, that, that's, a, that's a great question. So, I actually had a, a, a former investor in my last venture capital firm. His name is Max. You might have known him. He was a Green Beret as, as well. Uh, and, and he's now a lawyer in, um, uh, in, in D.C. And whenever I have dinner or meet somebody more successful than me, uh, which is basically every meeting, I always ask for a, a little bit of feedback. And so I asked Max. I, I, asked him, I asked him, how do you develop confidence you know what have you learned in your career and he was a trial lawyer too and i said do you ever get nervous you know getting up in front of um you know other lawyers in court do you ever get nervous and he looked at me and he said no man you know, I, I i i was in in central america with guns pointed in my face back in the 80s and 90s i guess under reagan whatever he was he worked as a green Beret. i don't get nervous because i've i've been in, in situations like that Perception becomes reality, right? And he, he told himself that, um, you know, he's been in more difficult situations. And so he never gets nervous. Really nice guy. I learned a lot. Oh, I also learned from Max this. Speaking of, of parenting, um, there's a question on parenting a minute ago. I asked him on parenting. He, ha he has a son. And he bought me dinner at his golf club uh, in, um, in D.C. when I met with him a couple of years ago. Uh, and, and I asked him about parenting as well. And, and he said that... He plays golf with his son. His son's a teenager a lot. And he doesn't ask his kids, uh, you know, how they're doing. If they want to open up and tell them something, tell him something while they're on the golf course, his son will do that. Otherwise, they, they don't really talk as much, whatever. Uh, the kid will open up when he wants to. And so I actually golfed on Sunday with, with, with two of my kids. And, and I, I recorded vlogs and I'll release those vlogs soon. Uh, but there's nothing more beautiful than 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 golfing with your children uh, and then just have them open up to you in between holes 
uh, when you're sitting on the bench or when you're walking on the fairway about issues they have in life or asking for advice. I know that's a little bit off topic, but you mentioned a green beret and I wanted to bring that up. So um, in terms of, um, for those of you not familiar with West Point, it's, it's one of the best schools on the planet. Um, very impressive. Uh, and to become a Green Beret is, is next to impossible. It's amazing. So that, that's incredible. Wow. Wow. I'm, I'm so I'm touched you're on my call. Um, and, and I love what you're doing to, um, to, to, to help veterans enter into finance careers. Um, and, and I actually had um, <clears throat> a, a, form, a guy I was mentoring years ago named uh, Matthew uh, Felicelli. Matt Felicelli. You can look him up if you want on, on LinkedIn. You'll see that I'm connected with him. Um, he actually, um, he created a, a program like yours uh, for veterans. Uh, and um, he did a lot of, um, a lot of uh, free work and, and charity work in that area. I'm sure that Matt Felicelli would be happy to, to talk to you about that. Um, but that, that's, that's really cool you did that. So in terms of helping you, so th- the way that I'm, I'm interested in helping is on this call. So um, come on this call every, every Thursday, uh, and I'll give you all of my advice for, forever, I, I promise you. Um, in, in terms of getting much more involved in that outside of, of this, uh, when I do my MBA program, of course, I'll, I'll help all my students with, with their business models and stuff. But it's just too hard for me because I get a million inbounds. So the best time to do it is just during this call. I'd be happy to humbly offer you my, my thoughts on, on, on anything. And Fred, Fred, do you mind if I asked you something? Um, <clears throat> pardon me. Can I ask you to share one piece of advice with everybody on this call right now? Just type it. Uh, that you've learned uh, in your life um, that has helped you get to where you are right now. Uh, so just provide us all with one piece of advice. And, and I always do this whenever I meet with somebody that has a really interesting, amazing background. So please just share it with us. And that's actually the crux of my book called The 101 Crucial Lessons They Don't Teach in Business School. It's based on 101 meetings I have with successful business people. All right, let's see. But yeah, I I think that's a a great business model. I think it's admirable. And I know that's not a business to you because your your heart's into it, something you're passionate about. And I know you can be incredibly successful at it, given your background and whatnot. So yeah. But any questions you have about that, uh, please uh, please let me know um, uh, on this call. I'm, I'm happy to help. Um, that's awesome. Amazing. All right. Good day, Myron. How are you? How do I handle failure? Or how would you uh, advise someone uh, to, to handle failure in, in life or at work? Okay. So the question was, how do you handle failure? I think you embrace failure because every time you fail, you get closer to realizing your dream in life. And and most people, they actually quit after failing one or two times and they never live their life on their own terms because of that. You have to fail a lot to be successful. And everybody that's ever been successful in life has failed more times than you and I have combined. Everybody, you know, uh, Steve Jobs and Bill Gates, their first companies were failed uh, ventures. Everybody that's written a book and gotten published has been rejected by tons and tons of editors. J.K. Rowling, who wrote uh, the Harry Potter series, she failed, she was rejected about 30 times. Failure is cool. Failure is not shameful. I think you should embrace failure and see it as nothing more as an indication that you are getting closer to realizing you know, your, your dreams in life. Don't give up on your dreams. And don't worry about failure. And don't give a damn what anybody thinks of you if you fail. Who cares what they think? You know, their opinion of you does not have to become your reality. In fact, their opinions of you doesn't matter at all. They are irrelevant in the whole scheme of things. All that matters is your opinion of yourself. And so failure is cool. And different regions in the world embrace failure and different regions don't. And I'm sorry to stereotype, but I'm going to. So here in the Bay Area, where 50% of all founders and engineers were born overseas, it's not an American thing. Here in the Bay Area, people embrace failure. Hey man, it's cool to fail. You know, everybody that's successful here in the Bay Area, most people, most people have failed a lot. It's cool to fail. Just keep trying, man. Who cares? It's cool. On the East Coast, uh, uh, where I'm from originally... Generally speaking, it's not cool to fail. It's shameful. But 
if you fail and then you're more successful later in life, they forget about the failure. In some, in some, in some countries in the world, in some countries in the world, um, failure is so shameful that if you fail and you're more successful later in life, all people remember is the failure. That's tragic. And the way around that is just to tell yourself, I don't give a damn what people think about me. I'm going to live my life on my terms. Yes, I'm going to fail a lot, but I'm going to be incredibly successful because Michael Jordan had that great quote where he said, I failed over and over and over again. And that is why I succeed. So I want you to embrace failure. Think about athletes, man. Like every athlete has failed a lot, right? But they got there by just working hard at it. Think of how many shots Michael Jordan has missed. Think about baseball, where if you can hit only 30% of, of the time uh, and strike out 70% of the time or not get a hit, you're incredibly successful. Think about dealing with that 70% failure rate. Embrace failure. Embrace it. It gets you closer to your dreams. Okay. All right. Next up, if you have questions, please type your questions. I don't see that many left uh, and I want to stay on forever. Uh, so uh, type your questions now. All right. All right. Uh, hello from India. Hello. Oh, and, and Dave Nitro is uh, Mr. Nitro. Dave is saying, I forgot to tell you, thank you for introducing us to the Bulletproof Coffee. Oh my God. I'm now addicted to it uh, with a grass-fed butter. It tastes great and gives me great energy in the mornings. That's awesome, man. Awesome. Nice. I'm actually drinking it right now in, in here. And for those of you not familiar with Bulletproof Coffee, uh, it, this is a biohack. And, and let me just go through it really quickly because when I started taking it, it helped me to write a couple of books. And I feel like uh, Bradley Cooper from the movie Limitless. I can just inhale information, except I'm much better looking than Bradley Cooper. Uh, people mistake me for Bradley Pitt or Bradley Pitt's a lot. It just happens. I'm just kidding. No, but what I did was this. Um, I started taking a Bulletproof coffee and I'm able to really, really focus. I'm able to do these calls with you, you know, and focus really, really, really long. Okay. Most of the time. Um, but let me tell you what Bulletproof coffee is. Bulletproof Coffee was created by a, a Canadian represent uh, from Vancouver. And he created this company and he creates special coffee beans. Uh, and the coffee beans are made and processed without mold. And what happens is when you drink regular coffee, um, what happens is there's mold on those coffee beans when it's being processed. And so um, you actually get that quick, quick fix buzz from coffee. Then you crash hard and it slows you down. So Bulletproof Coffee is made without mold. Also, there's an oil you buy from Bulletproof called uh, Bulletproof Oil Coffee. Uh, and the oil, it's like coconut oil. It's called MCT oil. And if you do it, only put a couple of drops in your coffee initially and ease into it slowly. Otherwise, I promise you, you will get a stomachache. And that oil, along with one more thing you put in the coffee, gives you insane attention span. Insane attention span. The other thing you put in I was buying time there because I forgot what it was. The other thing you put in is, is butter, organic grass-fed butter. And people have been putting a, a scoop of butter uh, in their uh, coffee for hundreds and hundreds of years. It helps you to focus. And it tastes good too. I don't put milk in it or, or, or sugar. It just tastes like when you put butter, it kind of tastes like it has cream or milk in it. It's great. So I, I recommend trying it. Um, that's, that's one of my, my biohacks that I continue to do in my life, which helps me to, um, to speak gooder. And think better. All right. Um, next up is uh, from Andrew. Andrew Dupree. Andrew, you, me, and Dupree. It's a, a good movie with Owen Wilson, I think, right? So Andrew um, is saying, hello, uh, Mr. Haroon. Please call me Chris. My, my son's name is Andrew. My middle name is, is Andrew as well. My youngest one is Dylan. And my wife, Christine, when she was naming Dylan, said if it was up to me, my kids would be called Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Okay. And actually, my, my youngest one, we call him Dylan. Um, and uh, at one point, I wanted to call him Luke. But the other boys, the older brothers, threw a fit. They said, I don't want baby brother to be named Luke. I want to name him Han Solo. It's a true story. It's funny. All right, next up is, um, uh, have I watched the Jimmy uh, Pearsall uh, film? I have not. I have not. But, but send me a message here. Let me know where it is. And I'll, I'll check it out. Thank you. All right, another one from Juan David. Uh, thank you, Chris. Uh, you've been great help since I found you and took your MBA course in 2016. Wow. Thank you, man. 
Um, you can't imagine how much you've helped me. Uh, we'll meet someday in person. Thank you, Juan David. I, I appreciate that. Um, thank you. It, it is, it, this, all my students inspire me so much. Um, I, I love being able to, to, to get up every day and, and do what I'm passionate about. And um, you all help me out as well a lot. It's, it's symbiotic. It's, it's a great relationship. And, and thank you, Juan David, for that comment. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. All right, uh, I got a question here from uh, from Dante. Um, if you have a question, type them now. Otherwise, um, I'll wrap up the call soon. And I'm happy to stay on forever. This is fun for me. I'm having fun. Please let me more, please let me have more fun. All right. Uh, next up, uh, uh, I've got a question from uh, Dante. Uh, Dante is saying, "Hi, Chris. It's funny that you've mentioned art history because I was the only Asian student in an art history class during my undergrad." Do you think uh, you will lose focus if you are too worldly? No way, man. No way. Um, no way. Not at all. I, I think the more worldly you are, I think the better business person uh, you'll be in life and the more successful you'll be. I mean, what a beautiful thing, understanding different cultures. What a beautiful thing it is to travel a lot as well. And for those of you that uh, are about to get uh, married um, and you're taking off some time from work or school to go on a honeymoon... I want you to go on a longer honeymoon than you think, and I want you to take on a little bit more debt than you think you can manage. And I want you to travel to more countries than you think you have time to go to. Because what happens is this. Usually when you go on tours and you're in different cities, if you look on the tour bus, people are either really young or really old. There's not as much in between. A lot of it is because you have kids in between, right? So Try to take that trip if you can. And even if it's not a honeymoon, just travel a lot. Because I think that traveling and understanding different cultures is a wonderful extension of your education. Okay. Okay. So, no, you can never be too, too worldly. So, and Dante is saying, is coding more of a habit than a talent? No. I, I think it's a talent. I think coding is a talent like, like golf is a talent or baseball is a talent or being a comedian as a talent. All those aff aforementioned career tracks involve talented people that are doing what they love. And I know for a fact that the most successful coders don't have a job, they have a passion. They love what they do. And I notice this mainly in the technology sector and less so in other sectors. People in the technology sector love what they do. They're so passionate about what they do. And I think that's one of the reasons why there are so many disruptive people creating amazing companies globally in the technology sector. And Andrew's saying, thank you to Fred for, for serving our country. Awesome. hoo -ah. Love it. Love it. Awesome. Okay, I'm going to jump ahead and read that quote by Fred. Okay, Fred. Okay, uh, so Fred said, um, uh, thanks, Chris. Let's stay connected. For sure, dude. And I will look up Matt. My advice, good. I asked Fred for advice before. This is awesome. I can't wait to read this. Never, ever, ever quit. Fucking A. Awesome. Even if you're beaten down and may even lose faith, just put one foot in front of the other and drive on. Thank you for that, Fred. That's awesome. Wrigley, let's make that, um, Wrigley, let's, Wrigley works with me. Let's make that our, our Instagram post, okay? One of our Instagram posts. And then quote uh, Fred as well, okay? That, that'll be a quote from him. Uh, Fred, I, I love that quote, man. Thanks for that. I'm going to read it again. My advice, never, ever, ever quit, even if you're beaten down and may even lose faith. Just put one foot in front of the other and drive on. I love it. I love it. Thank you, Fred, for that. Amazing, amazing. Always oh, got something else here. I'm eating this up. Thank you. More, please. Fred is saying, by perseverance, the snail reached the ark. Oh, my God, that's amazing. Wrigley, make that one another one of our, our, our Instagram quotes, daily ones too, please. And, and then put Fred there too. By perseverance, the snail reached the ark. Oh my God, I love that. I'm going to make that the title of one of my vlogs. Uh, and, and I will, I'll credit you. Uh, and I'm also going to mention uh, your, your wonderful quote here in, in one of my vlogs. Thank you so much for that, Fred. I, I appreciate that. Wow, that's amazing. It's amazing. I love it. I love it. And, and, and Fred, I hope you join us again and again and again. And, and I want you to please, and all of you, to share tons of quotes with us as well. And quotes I love also are quotes from your mothers or fathers. Um, you know, I, 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 I love hearing quotes uh, from different ages. 
And the vlog I'm publishing this Friday uh, is going to be a, a vlog based on touch hand once, which is a quote from successful older business people. You'll see what it, what it means this Saturday. It's awesome. Thanks for that, Fred. Appreciate that. God bless you. Awesome. Awesome. Amazing. Okay. Um, and I got a question. We, we've recently invested in a couple of your courses. Uh, looking forward to learning more from you. We appreciate your le leadership and, and experience. Thank you, Yakar. Thank you. I appreciate that. Uh, God bless you. Thank you for that. And 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 just know that there's a, a 30 day money back guarantee. Uh, and 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 just because I see your name, um, you know, getting the the, the money back, I, I don't care. Just please, if it's not value added immediately to you, if you don't get a thousand times the worth out of that course, uh, then just at, get get a refund, please. I, I, my, my feelings won't won't be hurt. Thank you for that. Thank you. All right, next up, um, did I miss any? If I missed any questions from anybody, I do that sometimes because the older I get, the better I was. <laughs> but if I missed any of your questions, just paste them again here because there's not many questions left. And if you have a question, please start typing it now. Thank you. All right, next up is, is from Neil. Uh, Neil is asking, how much is this coffee? Which brand is it? Okay, so it's called uh, Bulletproof Coffee. Uh, and... Um, you have to buy the MCT oil. Uh, I don't remember the price on it. It's a little bit pricey. I used to buy the pods as well for my Keurig machine, which was like a buck per pod. A little bit pricey, I know. Uh, but it's worth it in terms of productivity. Uh, and then you can get organic grass-fed butter at, at, at any um, organic supermarket. Okay. All right. And then uh, another question from Neil. Which language do you regret not learning when you were younger? Yeah, that's a great question. And, and I know that it's easier to learn languages when you're younger. So I spoke French in school before I spoke English. Um, I went to the Toronto French School and I only spoke French until the fourth grade uh, when I left TFS or Toronto French School to go to a, an English school. Um, but um, we weren't allowed to speak English. And I remember at recess, we'd say, ne parle pas anglais, that's okay. <laughs> um, but I, I kind of wish that I kept speaking French. Um, my, my, my French is a little bit rusty right now, um, unfortunately, but I, I wish I learned Mandarin and, and actually, um, uh, oh, Dante, you'll love this. When I lived in Ottawa, when I was working for Accenture, I lived in Sandy Hill and I worked uh, in Constitution Square at, on Albert Street for Accenture. Um, I went to University of Ottawa at nights and I took uh, Mandarin and, um, and it was so hard. It was so hard, and I wish that I had learned Mandarin earlier in life, uh, and I didn't keep up with it. It was so complicated because you have to put your tongue in different areas in your mouth when you're – it's so hard. It's so hard, um, and I think that writing is probably easier because each of those little images, uh, a little bit like kanji or Japanese a little bit, sorry, you can kind of recognize the characters like a fence, whatever, a person, a tree. Um, but I wish I had actually learned uh, Mandarin earlier in life. I, I really wish I did. Um, so – Anyway, and, and, and I never learned Arabic. Uh, so my dad is, his first language is Arabic, but my mom is, is half Lebanese. My dad's Egyptian. My mom is half Lebanese. The other half is Scottish, Irish. Um, I'm a bunch of everything, a little bit of French as well. Uh, Canadian, American, worldly, whatever, who knows. Um, but, but I never spoke Arabic at home because my mom didn't, didn't speak Arabic. But I could say words like, um, you know, imshi, fainik, uh, ya wallet. That's like an Arab thief, ya wallet, your wallet. Sorry, dad humor, no more. Falafel. I feel awful after I eat that falafel. That sort of thing. I wish I took Mandarin, though, to answer your question. Oh, my God. Uh, Andrew is uh, saying uh, Jimmy Pearsall was a baseball great with a temperament. Temperament. Uh, fear strikes out. Dude, how do I not know that? I, I know, like, everything about baseball. I mean, baseball is, is my favorite sport ever. I've watched every baseball movie a million times. I love it to death. Um, that's awesome. I'll, I'll look that up, though. Thank you. Thank you. Um, because the only dude I know in baseball that has great quotes is Yogi Berra. If you guys get a chance to do a search on, on Yogi Berra quotes, Yogi Berra said that baseball is 90% uh, mental and the other half is physical. And obviously the math doesn't add up there, but that just comes, comes it's just, it comes down to confidence like we were talking about earlier. Okay. That's great. So check out uh, Yogi Berra quotes if you can as well. And his son, Dale Berra, played for a while for Pittsburgh. All right, I see two more questions here. I don't see any more questions, so please enter your questions now. Uh, otherwise, uh, and I am going to threaten you all, I will end this call. I mean that in a good way. And if you're thinking of a question, uh, and it's taking you a while to come up with typing your question, just type a letter, like A or B, whatever, just hit enter, and I'll see a letter, and I'll know you're thinking of typing a question. 
All right, so two more questions here. Um, I've got uh, a question that says, uh, do you have a course on how to do a very attractive live video, uh, building rapport and getting a uh, lead from your, your videos? Uh, I do, I do actually. So um, what I would do is take my complete presentation course. It'll teach you how to prepare. It'll teach you everything except for the technology side. For the technology side of that, I want you to take my two free courses. Uh, one of them is called 40 Tips on How to Make a Great Online Course. And the other free course is called Another Tip on How to, uh, Another 40 Lessons on How to Teach a Course. I can't remember. I should take a course on how to speak better. Uh, but anyway, take those. Okay, so take my complete presentation course for delivery. And then take my two free courses on 40 Tips and Another 40 Tips on How to Teach Online because I teach you all the equipment from scratch. And Sasha Stevenson, who's one of my students, I met here uh, actually on my, my weekly uh, webcast. I think it was week 11 or 12, whatever. We're on week 22 today. Sasha Stevenson uh, and I are making uh, a number of YouTube courses this, this year. And um, we're going to teach you in one of those courses on how to vlog and how to speak on camera. And Sasha has got over 75 million views. She is huge uh, in, in Indonesia. She's Canadian as well. She has a really interesting story. Uh, she actually took acting classes as well. She's a big brand over there. And, and together, we're going to create um, just an amazing course for you so that you can understand how to leverage YouTube and how to, how to leverage speaking on camera and that sort of thing. And I'm, I'm always learning. I'm, I'm getting better. I just looked at the light there, and I, can't, I can barely see the screen now. <laughs> Uh, but anyway, so um, just take those uh, those courses I mentioned, please. All right. Uh, and again, if you have questions, enter them now or we're going to wrap up the call. Uh, uh, oh, and uh, uh, let me saying, uh, me too. I was born in a French speaking country and I did my high school years in French. Oh, it's awesome. Very cool. Very cool. Fondo. Awesome, dude. Yeah, no, I took French uh, in, in Canada. Uh, and I've been told actually um, that uh, Canadian French is different from uh, Parisian French. Um, not just accent wise, but, but also the dialect. And it's interesting because um, there's a very rich uh, French cultural history in Canada that, that I'm proud of being a Canadian. And what happened was um, the French Canadian, what they did with Quebec, which is one of the provinces in Canada, um, they wanted to preserve the culture. And so what they did was they preserved it to such an extent, and it's a beautiful thing, that a lot of time people, when they hear uh, Quebecois French, it sounds like Shakespearean English, some parts of it. It's, it's been preserved. It's pretty cool. It's pretty cool. All right. Uh, and I'm actually watching this show on, on Netflix now uh, with the dude from Aquaman. You know that big dude, Jason, whatever his name is. It's called Frontier. And it's about the Hudson's Bay Company and the fur trade uh, and, and the British involvement in Canada. It's actually not bad. It's pretty good. And I love it. Uh, again, it's on Netflix called Frontier. I love it because it's somewhat historical as well. Like when, when I feel like I'm kind of being educated as well when I'm watching series, which is kind of fun for me. Okay. Ray Donovan is done to the series, so I need a new show. All right. Um, next up. Um, oh, wow. Andrew uh, is, is from uh, Toronto. Andrew, awesome, dude. I didn't know that. I'm a 905er. I'm from Mississauga. You know, when I used to live in, in New York City, um, late at night, uh, when a certain group of people would come into the bars, they called the B&T crowd or the Bridge and Tunnels crowd, meaning people not from Manhattan. Canada is sort of like that, too, with Toronto. Uh, the certain crowd, which is me and my buddies, when we used to go into the bars late at night, whatever, people would say, oh, God, here comes the S&M crowd, which is the Scarborough and Mississauga crowd. Or they call us the 905ers because our area code is 905. That's cool. So, um that's cool. Andrew is a 416er, though. Um, oh, no kidding, dude. Your ancestors discovered Trois-Rivières uh, with the Champlain. That's awesome, man. That's aw dude, that is amazing. That is amazing. Uh, I, I wanted to ask them for um, advice on what made them so successful, or your ancestors that, that remember, and share it with us at some point, please, maybe this week or next week, whatever it is. That's very cool. Yeah, Andrew, check out that show then on, on Netflix, okay? Frontier. Uh, because it, it, it talks about the fur trade and just how brutal it was in Canada uh, at that point in time. And the Hudson's Bay Company, which is so powerful. Uh, and, and just how, how awful it was. Um, just anyway, a lot of issues then. Um, that's cool, man. Very cool. It's great to see. You made me think of that Rush song, uh, Lakeside Park. All right, cool. Rush is a great Canadian band, as everyone knows. All right, Jason. Um, 
is is oh I'm mentioning this uh, this is directly to Neil to you Neil when you talked about what language I regret not learning he's saying I regretted not learning uh, Brazilian Portuguese uh, when I was a child in Australia uh, my mother is Brazilian I started uh, learning at 43 uh, four years later I'm fluent it's never too late good for you too that that's awesome Jason fantastic fantastic and and Wrigley whose um, whose first language is is, Port- is Portuguese he, he's from um, uh, Sao Paulo he's from uh, Brazil. Uh, and uh, Wrigley uh, is is now working with me, uh, and I'm gonna I'm gonna make Wrigley Wrigley a rock star brand uh, in 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 the Brazilian teaching world um, because he's gonna take some of my courses. And I, Wrigley and I have talked about this. Wrigley, I'm too transparent. I'm sorry, but I'm I'm, I'm telling the world here because I'm, I'm so proud of you doing great things. Uh, we're gonna do one course every now and then. Uh, do a 50/50 rev share, uh, and then Wrigley's gonna create his own courses. And take 100% of that. And whether or not he decides to stay with me or not, it's totally up to you, Wrigley. I'll support you either way. Uh, longer term, I just want you to be very successful and happy. Wrigley's been awesome. Wrigley works with me. He's the best. And Wrigley, you're never allowed to quit, by the way. Just kidding. Okay, great. All right. Uh, blah, 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 blah. Oh, my God, Vinny. I, I sent you a message the other day. Did you see it? Remember when I, I wrote down that there's, there's something you're going to love in tomorrow's vlog? Remember, you, you had that emoji that looked like this. I don't know if you saw that, right? This is uh, Spock, Live Long and Prosper. I did it on my vlog yesterday. It, it, I've got to show you guys this. It's pretty funny. Um, so if you go to my, uh, go, go to my, my, my vlog, um, you guys are going to crack up about this. This is pretty funny. So if we go to uh, YouTube, let's go to Chris Rune Ventures here. Okay, good, yeah. And I published a vlog, um, I think it was yesterday, right here. How much money should you ask in investors for? Right here, you see it? So if you look at this, this image here, sorry, resolution is not great. Uh, that's um, on a $5 bill in Canada, one of our prime ministers looks a lot like, uh, like Spock. And so what people did is after Leonard Nimoy, God bless him, passed away, uh, is uh, they started drawing Spock on it. And um, bonus points for the person who tells me not only the name of this character, but what book series it's from, okay? Uh, it's pretty funny. Um, and, and on the back of this Canadian $5 bill used to be a bunch of kids playing hockey, which is so so awesome. It's so Canada. I love it. Uh, but the reason that Spock did that, actually, Leonard Nimoy, is it's an ancient um, a Hebrew greeting, right? This is what rabbis used to do. It's, it's, a, it's a greeting. And he adopted it, uh, and so did uh, Mork, uh, Robin Williams. No, 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 no. In Mork and Mindy, I'm dating myself there. Uh, but um, anyway, a little bit, little bit of useless uh, trivia for you yet again. Give me one second to get back here in frame. All right, there we go. Put my Twilight frame back on there. If I've ever been to Portland. I'd love to go there. That's where Twilight was filmed. So anyway, Vinny, that, that was for you. I, I hope you appreciated that. All right, so Vinny's got a comment. First of all, I thank you for being a true teacher. Thank you, dude. I studied your online MBA. I'll review this again. 101 Crucial Lessons course and currently your accounting and finance class. Uh, I can't believe I'm enjoying accounting and finance. Thank you so much. Thank you, dude. Um, and before I read your question, let me say something about accounting and finance. So I got a D in accounting the first time I took it at McGill University. Uh, and this was back uh, in the early 90s. I thought my life was over. And the reason I got a, <clears throat> pardon me, the reason I got a D in accounting is because I was memorizing these equations instead of understanding it. And once you understand accounting or finance or anything in business or life, you know, then you remember it and you enjoy it too. And I think the big difference between high school and university, which was a culture shock for me, is that in high school, you can memorize stuff and do well. But in university, you have to understand stuff to do well. And so don't ever memorize accounting and finance. Understand them. And if you understand accounting and finance, then you'll be able to read accounting statements like a good book. All right. You look for patterns. All right. So your question is, thank you, Vinny. uh, What specific legacies would you like to leave as your contributions to family, friends, and society? Um, I got to come back to this. So... I want to get, and I'm making an idiot of myself, okay, do, saying this. I know. I want to get an Academy Award one day for best business documentary. 
but I want it to be a socially aware business documentary that helps to make the world a better place. I don't know how yet. I'm trying to work on all this editing stuff. I suck at it. You can see the shadow on me from the one light because the power outage, the other light's not working here. Um, so legacy wise that I, I also think that when I teach and I put stuff online, I kind of think of my kids. Like sometimes when I teach, I'm just not into it. I think to myself, what if my kids one day or my grandkids want help on how to make a resume or how to understand accounting or whatever it is? Wouldn't it be cool if they can go on and, and learn from, from the old man? <laughs> that sort of thing. Um, so legacy wise, I just, I think everyone's the same as me, which is I just want to make the world a better place. Um, any way I can. And I think that teaching with technology, teaching in technology, can solve every problem in the world. And that was the crux uh, and topic of my, my TED talk, my TEDx talk I did at San Francisco State. Love San Francisco State, best school ever. Um, you know, it's, it's how T can solve all problems in the world, TEA, uh, technology, education, and acceptance. You know, and, and my vision of the world in the future is you have thousands and millions of Malala's rising up within society, wherever society is they're, they're based in, and changing society from within using YouTube. Now, everybody can get access to this stuff for free and anyone can teach for free, right? It's amazing. It's amazing. And that's how you make the world a better place. You know, and, and I don't think we need to send troops overseas to fight wars we can't win or understand. I think society can change from within. And it's happening slowly, but it's happening. It's happening. So anyway, and if you want more details on that, in addition to my TEDx talk, uh, on my, my vision of the future of the world, how to fix every problem in the world. Uh, go to my vlog and watch uh, my, my vlog on how to fix every problem in the world, which I recorded uh, when, I, when I gave a speech uh, in, in, in Brazil. Okay. Geronimo, you'll love that one. Geronimo's one of my, 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 uh, my, my students from, uh, from Brazil. All right. Um, next up, um, I've got, oh, and I also want to buy the Toronto Blue Jays. Okay, Gary, Gary Vaynerchuk. And for those of you who don't know Gary V, <clears throat> pardon me, if you want to learn about social media, Facebook and all that stuff and what to use, what not to use, uh, just go to uh, do a search on Gary Vaynerchuk and then scroll down to the bottom of his website. That's what you use. Gary V wants to buy the New York Jets. I want to buy the Toronto Blue Jays. I want to buy the Blue Jays. Uh, and I'm very embarrassed to say this, but I'm going to go there. Um, and Andrew, you'll love this because uh, you're from Toronto. But in 2015, uh, Jose Batista hit an amazing home run, which gives me shivers just thinking about it. It's the second best home run I've ever seen in my life on TV. Uh, Andrew, what was the first one? Number one. Okay. And that ball, uh, which made us win a playoff game, it was a big deal for Canadians, uh, is up for auction. And I bid on it. And it's still up for auction now. And I've, I've been outbid over the past week. Uh, and I can't bid any higher. It's it's up to 15000 which is way above what I was bidding at. Uh, but anyway, and, and I own a, Andrew, love this. I own a, a a seat from Exhibition Stadium. I bought it. It's up in my attic here, my man cave. All right, no more uh, baseball nerd talk on my part. Sorry. All right, next one, a question from Juan David. Um, <clears throat> Juan David is asking, what happened to Bitcoin? I invested in a crypto exchange, and they released their shareholder and company information Actually, a lot of institutional investors invested in 2018. So if you're asking what happened to Bitcoin, Bitcoin is down a lot uh, over the past year. It happens with all bubbles. Okay. And it happened with dot-com bubble one. Okay. Um, and uh, the internet uh, bubble burst in March of 2000 when there were a lot of companies trading at nosebleed valuations. Uh, and what happens is whenever a new secular growth sector emerges, Prices usually get inflated, uh, and eventually they, they get so overvalued uh, that the tourists or the people that are renting those financial instruments bail, and the long-term investors are licking their chops because they see it as, as a great opportunity to get involved longer term. Okay, and so a lot of tourists get involved. They, they rent stocks, uh, and it's, there's been so many bubbles in history. Like there's the, the rosebud or tulip, I should say, bubble in Europe hundreds of years ago. And the same, uh, I mean, human nature doesn't change, right? We're, we're, we're all herds. You know, people tend to follow the herd and buy because everybody else is buying. And Warren Buffett had that great quote, which is, the New York Stock Exchange is the only store in the world where consumers sell stuff when it goes on sale. Think about that. Think about that. And so people are selling Bitcoin and certain cryptocurrencies because everybody else is selling cryptocurrencies. 
And people are selling cryptocurrencies now because they see the cryptocurrency as not a great short-term investment. Okay, now the long-term investors are backing up the truck now in certain cryptocurrencies. I'll never tell you what stock or piece of real estate or commodity or cryptocurrency to buy. You know, it's not my job. My job is to humbly help you. I wanna teach you how to fish. Yeah, I don't wanna give you a fish. I think it's the best way to help. And so in my cryptocurrency course called the Complete Cryptocurrency Course, there's a 49-step template I created for you to help you understand cryptocurrencies. Please don't invest in cryptocurrencies unless you thoroughly understand what you're getting yourself into. And so the bottom line to answer your question on why did Bitcoin go down a lot, it's because a lot of short-term investors bailed and now the long-term investors can start to buy. And I personally love buying investments when everybody else is panicking. And I hate to use this term, but I will, uh, when there's blood in the streets. And that reminds me of that, that old song from uh, The Doors, Peace Frog. Yeah, when there's blood in the streets. Um, that's when I love to buy stocks or any financial instrument. Because if everybody is buying the same investment, then who's the incremental investor to push it higher? Nobody. Nobody. So you want to be contrarian. And to quote Warren Buffett, I know he's not a Bitcoin fan, but he has a great quote. He said that the longer uh, the view, the wiser the intention. And you want to be greedy when others are fearful and fearful when others are greedy. And always ask yourself the five-year rule question, which is this. In five years, will this company that I'm considering investing in be more relevant or less relevant than it is today? And that will help you to be long-term focused. And being long-term focused when you're investing will help you out a lot from a timing perspective. You know, Wayne Gretzky and Andrew, I have to quote the great one, Gretzky, because you're Canadian and, and everyone should love Wayne Gretzky, right? It's important. <laughs> so Wayne Gretzky, who's a, a great, humble, wonderful Canadian, when he was asked why, why is he successful, he said, because I never skated to where the puck is, but rather I skated to where the puck is going to be. I want you to be the same when it comes to investing. I want you to invest in companies that people are going to like. How? By asking yourself the five-year five rule question, which is this. In five years, will this company be more relevant than it is today? And if the answer is yes, then investors are going to like that stock and you should consider buying it. Okay. All right. Next up, uh, I've got a question from, um, uh, from, from Neil. Actually, Neil is making a comment. That's great, at Jason. Uh, good for you. So Jason is learning uh, Portuguese. Um, I had the chance to continue learning Mandarin at school, and I didn't take it. I might, I might give it a go again. Uh, what was the best method you learned Portuguese? Interested. Uh, and then Jason responded saying, I used a bunch of tools, an in-person teacher course quiz and flashcard apps every day to help with the vocab and grammar. Um, that's awesome. Okay. And you, you practice YouTube, Netflix and books. And a lot of people, it's interesting. Uh, I have a lot of friends uh, that, that immigrated to Canada uh, and uh, they had to learn English. And they said the best way they learned English was watching TV. That's what it, the best way they, they learn the language, right? So yes, watch Netflix. That can, that can help a lot, eh? And you can turn on closed captions too. It's amazing. That's how you can learn stuff now. It's, it's, it's awesome. It's awesome. So um, that's fantastic. And I wonder, I wonder if there's a, a Udemy teacher that teaches languages. I mean, there, there has to be. There has to be a market for that, right? Okay. All right, cool. Let's see what we got here. Oh, cool. Abdallah is, is saying... Uh, yeah, Walad is, hey boy, cool, I'm Egyptian. It's 9 p.m. here. Dude, you're, you're in Egypt. That's awesome. Very cool. So, Yawalet, uh, my dad used to say to me, he'd say, Fayanik, or Imshi, or Yawalet, uh, which means, hey boy. I guess uh, it's kind of like country boy talk for in Egypt. Hey boy. Um, Yawalet. And I joked earlier that that's an Arab thief, Yawalet, which is awful dad humor on my part. That's awesome. You're, you're, uh, you're, you're in Egypt. That's fantastic. I'm actually, I'm good friends with um, one of my students who, when I guess lecture at Stanford, his name is Jawad Nabulsi. Um, and, and Jawad is uh, one of the two guys, uh, along with uh, Wael, uh, that started the Arab Spring back in 2011. I can tell you the whole story, if you're curious right now, on, on how he used Facebook to change Egypt and Tariri Square, if, if you care, if, if you're curious. But that's, that's great you're there. And what I'm going to say now I, applies to everybody on the call um, if, if your parents were born in a different country. If you haven't visited their birthplace, and I have not visited Egypt, unfortunately, but if you've not visited their birthplace, what I want you to do is this. And I did this with my dad. 
I want you to go to uh, Google Earth together online, and I want you to record it. And I want your mom and dad to walk you through where they grew up, okay, and zoom in. And I want them to tell you everything. It's a legacy thing that should be recorded so that your great-great-grandchildren can see it. You know, little things like my dad said, uh, um, you know, here's, here's where I would get a loaf of bread. That's how my dad says bread. Bread. You have to roll the R's. It sounds cooler, right? <laughs> Sorry, dad, if you're watching, I don't think you are. Uh, but you should do that. Do that. Do it with your grandparents as well or your aunts and uncles. Is it aunt or aunt? I'm not sure. Whatever. But with all your relatives, get them to do it. Get them to walk you through it. And maybe make it a family event. You know, next time you get your families together, you know, get, get it. Maybe um, put your uh, using AirPlay or your iPad or whatever it is or your Android device, put it up on the big TV, you know, a browser or Google Earth or whatever it is. And have your relatives walk you through where they grew up. And Dante, we talked about studying art history and whatnot and how that's important from a culturing perspective. The same thing applies to this, you know, knowing your heritage, culturing yourself, you know, through your, your parents, your, your family, your, your close and distant relatives by documenting it with Google Earth. I think everybody should do that. Everybody should do that. Okay. All right. So next, next up, um, it's funny because Jason's mentioning he uses flashcards. My, my kids, when they learn Spanish here uh, in, in the, the Hillsborough uh, and Burlingham school system in California, they, um, they, they use technology a lot for flashcards. And, and my kids will ask uh, Alexa a lot of questions too. Okay, uh, Vinny's going to check out that uh, Live Long and Prosper thing. Awesome, thank you. And then Zach, and, and Zach, Zachary said I can call him Zach uh, a couple of webcasts ago. Zach saying, hi, Chris, uh, what does, what does a tech consultant do? What would you do? What would you do a uh, suggestion to somebody who wants to have a side hustle as, as a consultant? Okay. So a tech consultant can do a number of things. So when I worked at Accenture, I worked in technology consulting. There's a number of different divisions. There is strategy consulting. Okay. Which helps the company that you're consulting with understand their longer term strategy. And that's what consulting firms like McKinsey do or Boston Consulting Group. And those are the most prestigious ones. And I know that because I got rejected from those two companies. Then there's process-oriented consulting on the tech side, which basically is you help your clients understand data flow processes, right? Like diagrams and setups for databases and other items. And by the way, if you live here in the Bay Area and you drive by Oracle's headquarters in Redwood City, the buildings are all set up to look like database diagrams. It's kind of neat. Then there's also um, the engineering side of consulting. Uh, and when I worked at Accenture, I was in the, the tech group uh, where we did uh, programming and stuff. And a lot of companies don't want to hire a lot of programmers to create software programs or whatever it is. And by hiring consulting firms, they can outsource it. So when the project is done, they can get rid of that added expense immediately. Then there's something called change management or CMS. They might have rebranded it since at, at, at Accenture, but it's basically... A, a great teaching tool on how to leverage and understand how to use technology. And they do other things as well. We used to joke that CMS stood for chaps making slides. That's going to come back to haunt me, I know. So anyway, that, that, that's a little bit of color on, on, on what tech consultants do. All right, so um, next up. Yeah, and so if you want to be a, uh, Zach, if you want to be a technology consultant, you know what I recommend actually is take my complete business plan course, okay, and write your business plan with me, okay? The course will make you, it'll help you write a business plan from scratch. And I'll, I analyze everything to it, everything, like every uh, qualitative framework and quantitative framework as well. And when you build your financial model in my course, and I'll explain to you from scratch how to do it, even if you have no background at all in this, I teach you how to make a services or a product-based uh, financial model. And so in your case with technology consulting, it's similar to, uh, to a, a law firm, uh, which is basically you build by the hour and the model will do that as well. So write your business plan first always. And, and that goes for everybody in the call. Please write your business plan first before starting a company because, and this is kind of a cliche and cheesy quote, but failing to plan is planning to fail. So in taking my business plan course, you might realize after, I don't know, half an hour into the course and writing your business plan, your business plan is no good. And so you might think of another business plan to write or just get a refund on my course. 
There's a 30-day money-back guarantee always. Okay. Next up is uh, Neil is saying um, Bill Ackman um, made a really insightful video on investing. Check it out if you want to get started. He did. This is great. I saw it. He's, he's great. He's great. He's good. He's an activist investor as well. Um, he's very vocal. He's, he's, uh, he's a rock star. Okay. All right. Um, uh, Neil's got a comment. Thanks, Jason. I'll start watching Asian programs on Netflix then. Ha ha. It's so interesting because I've started to notice that a lot of great movies uh, have Chinese production companies and American production companies at, at the beginning of it. Uh, and uh, it's because I think it's, they're being co-marketed in two different markets. There's a lot of great Chinese actors and American actors and, and other actors from around the world as well. Uh, and I mention that because I, I bet you that um, if those uh, those are in English, there's definitely Mandarin uh, of subtitles there uh, as well. Okay, so um, uh, Zach has asked me, what do I think about the Robinhood investing app? Uh, and would you think about their, the, what do I think about the future of that company? I've received that question so many times and... I've never done the research on it. I don't know about it. I, I was, I was involved uh, in the. There's a Robin Hood Foundation, and when I lived in New York City, that hedge funds were in, uh, which is a, it, which it was a charity, Robin Hood, because you know, robbing from the rich, giving to the poor. It's pretty cool. I'll look into it. Sorry, I, I don't know though. I don't know. All right, next one I've got is hi Chris. Could you advise on how to deal with negative secret emails about you? Oh, interesting. I happened to discover one sent on me. And was utterly shocked. Uh, any advice, please? Wow. I never got a question like that. I love it. Thank you. So w- when you work for other people uh, and in a big company, um, you got to keep your cards close to your chest. Think of it like a poker game. Um, never let anyone know what you're thinking unless they're really good friends of yours. There's a lot of backstabbing that goes on. And a lot of times people that rise through the ranks in big bureaucratic companies don't do so because they're great at their job. They're just very political. And that's one of the reasons why I hated big business and I got out of that racket. I hated it. I hated it. And I hated going to the corporate picnic every year, which I would call forced family fun. I hated it. I hated getting into elevators and, you know, a senior person was there and I'd really think three times about what to say, and then I'd say something. And then after the elevator ride, I'd think to myself, did I say the right thing? Was that right? Did I help my career? I hated not being me. I hated that. And one thing I'll say, and I'm sorry that you're going through this with people writing that, that the negative emails about you, but the positive, and I'm such a glass half full positive person, a little bit naively positive I am sometimes, to be honest. The positive about that is, is that it'll make you frustrated. And frustration is a good thing. It's a healthy thing. Because frustration forces you to think about quitting and starting your own company. And I want you to start your own company on the side. I want you to start many companies on the side. And then one, when one works, then I want you to quit. That's something I've been doing for many people I've worked for in the past. I won't name which ones, but I've done that a lot. I want you to start your own companies. Okay. And if you're worried that people at work are going to find out about that, uh, or you know, because everything is indexed browser-wise, then... What you can do is get your own personal phone. Don't use a work phone ever, okay? If they give it to you, use it, but get a personal phone as well. And on your personal phone, you have a Wi-Fi network you can set up, okay? So that you could surf uh, the web uh, from work. That's right. Uh, if you have to work through dinner hour and FaceTime is, is, is an issue and it's total bullshit just to be there for FaceTime reasons. But I want you to hook up to your own personal Wi-Fi network and I want you to write your business plan. And I want you to keep doing this till you come up with something that works then I want you to quit your job. And that frustration you're feeling by those jerks uh, that are writing those emails about you that you saw, um, again, the positive is that it'll force you to, you know, move outside your comfort zone and start your own company. In many years, you'll look back and you'll think to yourself, maybe I'm grateful that happened. And one thing I'll say, and this will really help you deal with criticism and everybody on this call. Unjustified criticism is nothing more than a disguised compliment. And so when I get criticized unfairly, I think to myself, thank you for the compliments. Thank you for that compliment. And the more successful you become, the more people will criticize you. Okay? And I want you to just take a step back and see the forest from the trees and understand that people are always going to be jealous of your accomplishments. And that's a compliment. So thank you for that compliment is what I want you to tell yourself in your head. 
So it sounds like it's a, it's a rough political environment to be in. I hope that you can leave that company or start your own company. And again, I'm sorry you're going through that, that whole process of all those negative emails. Um, ridiculous. But the positive is that you might be frustrated enough to, to leave and get a better job or more importantly, to live your life on your own terms by creating your own business model and your own corporate culture. And in your own corporate culture, you'll treat people better. Like I remember when I worked at Accenture years ago uh, in Toronto, actually, and there was this one partner, um, and I'll never name him, but he was from the Orange County office. And the client side at the time was Manulife. We were working on the merger of Manulife and um, Confederation Life, which declared uh, bankruptcy back then. And this one partner was a real jerk to me. And it was late one night. And he asked me to print a database report. And I tried hard to do it. I couldn't do it. I couldn't do it. I tried. And I went to him. I said, I'm sorry. I couldn't. I, I, I don't know how to do it. And he goes, it's because you're incompetent. And then he turned around and he walked away. And, and, and I remember at that time how frustrated I was. And, and there was a TV show on, uh, on TV then called Mel, Melrose Place. And uh, D&D Advertising was this cutthroat company there. And I thought to myself, this is not D&D Advertising. And I was hurt. I was hurt. But in hindsight, I'm so glad that happened because it motivated me to get the hell out of there and start my own company. And so hopefully you can also channel your frustration into a powerful weapon and start your own company so you can live your life on your terms. I'm glad that happened to me in hindsight. I'm glad that jerk did that to me because it forced me to get out of the you know, the, the, the hairball, uh, big uh, bureaucratic environment of working for somebody else. When you're not getting paid for, you know, making the firm money, you're getting paid for being political. It forced me to get outside my comfort zone and take a risk and start my own company, which is the best thing I've ever done professionally. Okay. All right. Running out of questions here. If you have questions, write them down. Otherwise, I will wrap it up soon. All right. Um, bah, bah, bah. And, and never, you know, as a little side note there for your email thing, obviously never write, I never write anything in email that I don't want everybody in the world to see. And the same thing when I answer questions from customers, whatever, I've always been like this. I always know that I'm one email or one answer away from bankruptcy. And I know that sounds extreme, but Andy Grove, the late great Andy Grove, who used to be the, uh, the CEO of Intel, he wrote a great book called Only the Paranoid Survive. And, and I'm a little bit like that sometimes too. And Microsoft used to be very paranoid too. Bill Gates used to always say in the 90s even that Microsoft is one and a half years away from bankruptcy. Right? I know it's far-fetched, but that's how successful people like Gates and Andy Grove think or thought. And so I'm the same way when it comes to uh, communications. You know, with, with every email I type or, or every question I respond to, uh, I'm always very careful I assume, and you should always assume that every email you type for the rest of your life, every text that you type for the rest of your life, every phone call you're on for the rest of your life, every voicemail you live for the rest of your life can be recorded and everybody can see it forever. And I worked in financial services on Wall Street and I know a lot of our calls were recorded and so we were kind of trained to think that way as well. That's a separate side note. But the bottom line is I think that you should always be very careful uh, when it comes to corporate communications. You're always one Snapchat or, or one tweet or one email away from destroying a career. And Warren Buffett used to always say that it takes 30 years to create a reputation and 30 seconds to ruin it. I, I think it's half a second, you know, by, by sending out one tweet or, or sending out one Snapchat. And that stuff is forever, by the way. It is recorded. So just be really, really careful. And my dad actually gave me this great old school advice, which I love. Um, my dad said this, he said, Chris, if you ever write a letter and you're a little bit negative in the letter or upset, don't mail that letter that day. I want you to take that letter and put it in your drawer. And when you wake up, if you still feel the same way, then mail that letter. You know, the same thing can be said for communications, you know, at, at work or emails, don't ever send an email when you're upset or, or whatever. Just be careful. And watch out for blind copying too. That, that can be kind of a trap. And I used to get Christine to read all of my emails. All my, some of my important ones, I should say. Christine's my wonderful wife. And she would give me feedback as well. You know, she might say, put the word please or thank you there. And, and every email I've ever written, for the most part, most of them, 
Uh, and you'll see this within, um, within Udemy when I answer questions. I, I, I put thank you, sometimes twice, thanks again. And I put please, it's just the way I am. So anyway, the bottom line there is emails and all corporate communications are forever. Um, consider getting a, a second phone if you can, if you have the budget for it, if your company gives you a phone, okay? Get a personal phone. This is your personal life, not theirs, okay? And they can use anything they want against you, okay? Anybody can look through all of your texts, your work texts from the past 10 years, whatever it is, and find something. Your lawyers, that's what they do, unfortunately. They can find something to get you. So have two phones if you can. I even have a friend... <laughs> I know a guy, actually, um, he, he manages uh, the French market uh, for, for a wonderful media company out here in the Bay Area, and he has two phones. One is for when he gets Uber in America, and another one is for when he gets Uber uh, in France, because the rating system, and I hope I'm not stereotyped by saying this, but, but he told me this, that in, in France, when people rate each other, it's, it's a little bit lower, uh, and so he wouldn't be able to get an Uber ride as easily in America if he used his French phone, that sort of thing. So if I'm wrong about that, please, somebody correct me. Okay. All right. Um, next one I've got is a question on what do you think of the future of credit risk management? Uh, will it still be relevant 10 years from now? Yeah, I mean, a absolutely. Absolutely. It's just like, like this portfolio construction will always be relevant. Always. You know, risk management in general will always be relevant. And for those of you not too familiar with risk management, um, one example of risk management is say you have a, you, you own a bunch of stocks. Um, you might not want to have more than 5% of that portfolio in one stock. That's risk management. You might not want to have too many stocks in one sector, like the tech sector in a portfolio. That's risk management. Maybe you want to limit each sector to 20%. Maybe you don't, you might not want to have too many stocks from certain countries in your portfolio. That's risk management. That's all part of portfolio management. When it comes to credit risk management, it focuses a little bit more on the debt side, a little bit less so on the equity. And so I think that credit risk management will always, always be relevant, just like how equity risk management will always be relevant. People will always want to understand how to decrease volatility in their portfolio, whether it's a credit-based or an equity-based portfolio. And people will always want to mitigate risk, always. And diversification is one of the ways to do that. And I teach all of these concepts in my complete personal finance course as well. On the debt topic, which is credit, as well as equity, which is stocks, and real estate, as well as other classes of investments, like commodities and ETFs in general. All right, next up. Um, hey, Chris, I'm struggling to land a graduate job. So I'm thinking of contacting a couple companies for some unpaid work. I think you mentioned that you've done the same. How did you get uh, into that, that, that contract? Hold on one second. The, the wind just blew the door open again. I'll answer that question. And we're running out of questions. So please type questions, everyone. All right, and as I answer all these questions, I always try to make them generic enough so it applies to everybody. Um, so you're struggling to get a job and you wanna contact companies for unpaid work. Okay, so here's what I recommend doing. You can't just get a job the easy way by sending your resume. It's too hard because what happened with online is for every job application you see online, you got thousands of people uh, trying to get a job as well and sending in their resume. The best way to do it is to network, okay? And the easiest way to network is to download my book for free. Okay, it's a 200 page book on networking. I promise you it works. It'll help you get a job. And go to my website to get it, uh, all lowercase, uh, haroonventures.com. And that book will teach you all the secrets when it comes to networking. And I think the best way to get a job is to actually set up informational meetings. And so what you can do is you can do an advanced search in LinkedIn and find people with things that are similar to you. And my book will talk about that in more details too, okay? Uh, let's say that um, I'm, you know, somebody contacts me and says, hi, Chris, I'm also from Mississauga. My, my dad is also Egyptian and I also used to work at Accenture. Please let me know if you have time for a coffee. I'll probably say yes to that message, okay? Because that person reminds me of me 20 years ago. 
I want you to think of somebody that is, that is going to think that you remind them of themselves 20 years ago. So I know it sounds a little bit elusive, right, or, or tough to understand, but I want you to picture yourself 20 years in the future. You're way more successful 20 years in the future than you are today. And this younger person reaches out to you that reminds you a lot of yourself and wants to grab a coffee. Would you meet with that person? Would you meet with the 20-year younger version of you? Of course you would. I don't want you to say why you want that meeting. Okay? Just use the word please, thank you, and what you have in common. And do it on LinkedIn because everybody reads every single LinkedIn message they get. I know you do. You all do. I do. Don't use email. Nobody opens email anymore. Don't use text. It's, it's like, yeah, get out of my house whenever I get a text from me. I don't know. That sort of thing. Use LinkedIn. Keep it short. Make the subject line in LinkedIn hi because everybody opens messages that says hi. And everyone opens LinkedIn messages anyway. And the contents of the message, again, keep it simple. John, hope all is well. Uh, and then you list one thing in common. Please let me know if you have time for a coffee. Thanks, Chris. One or two things in common. Never say I want a job or never say you want something because they won't respond. Not because they don't want to help you. It's just because they might feel bad they can't help you. So please read my book and I promise you, I guarantee it, you will get a job. Okay, you got to network a lot. And, and it's funny because, uh, and, and Wrigley, who uh, works with me, he was one of my students when I, when I taught during the evenings at San Francisco State. What I would do is with every class, on the very first day of class, I would get to know my students, but I would also tell them, if I told you, all of you, that if you did 10 informational meetings using LinkedIn, using the methodology I just taught you guys, if I told you if you did 10 of those, that you would get the job of your dreams, would you do, all, would you do 10 meetings? Every hand goes up. Then the last day of class, I ask, how many people did it? Did 10 people do it? No, no hands go up. Nine, no hand squat. Sometimes eight, sometimes seven, whatever. And whoever lifted their hands for the seven or eight times, whatever, those are never the students with the top grades. Those are the students that do get the best jobs, though. I believe that students that get the top grades don't always get the best jobs. I believe students that are well-balanced uh, and, and, you know, know how to navigate the sandbox, so to speak, uh, they get the best jobs and they're the most successful in life. And so you got to network a lot. And you're going to fail a lot when you do that. Some people aren't going to respond. And some of the meetings might not work out that well. I want you to fail more often. Because every time you fail, you get closer and closer to success. That's how you get a job. That's how you get a customer. That's how you get a business partner, etc. Network. Network, network, network. Ask and you will receive. It's been true since the beginning of time. And it's prophetic too. So for homework... I want you to go to YouTube and do a search on three words, Steve Jobs Ask. And just watch that video. And you'll see that Steve Jobs did that as well. I want you to ask more often. Okay. All right, next up we have got, all right, um, and I've got a question. I don't like to talk about politics, but I know only what L uh, Facebook until now, big thing in Egypt. We have community about uh, anime and meet each other. It's a pleasure to visit us in Egypt Sunday for sure. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you. So, and, and, and one day if you want, I, I could talk politics if, if you want to, but about Egypt. Um, and um, Joad Nabulsi is, is my, my buddy, great guy. Um, anyway. I, I won't tell you all that stuff. Uh, you're not just, that's okay. That's cool. Thank you, though. All right. Uh, oh, you're welcome for that one. Thanks. All right. I see the last question here. I'm going to wrap it up. Um, so if you have questions, enter them now. Or if you're thinking of a question, just enter one letter. Uh, so I know that someone's typing something. Otherwise, I'll, I'll, I'll wrap it up soon. All right. So question is from RVC. Uh, and uh, the question is, Chris, how do we deal with competitive colleagues? For example... When they try to downplay your accomplishments or are harsh during meetings, I know exactly what you're going through. And this was why I was so frustrated working for other people and working in big companies because it's not a meritocracy. You don't eat what you kill. You don't get compensated or promoted based on the job you do. A lot of it is based on politics and who you know and how you play the game. And you're always going to be surrounded by jerks that are sharks. There are sharks in every company. 
Some of them, you don't know they're sharks right away. A couple of years later, you find out they are sharks. So just assume that most people are sharks. So the best way to deal with them is don't ever stoop down to their levels. Okay, I promise you that karma is a bitch and they will get caught for what they're doing. Okay, if they're seen as a backstabber, you know, somebody else will, will, will call them out in their bullshit one day. It'll happen. It'll happen. Don't worry. Just be yourself. Be a nice person. Do the best job you can. Get mentors within your company that care about you and your career and will help you rise through the ranks. And stay away from anybody that seems like a backstabber that's hyper competitive like that. Because again, I promise you, they will get fired or they will get reprimanded or they eventually will quit because nobody likes them. They will get caught. They will get caught. You know, it, it's, it usually happens. Um, you know, fool me once, shame on me. Or fool me once, shame on, shame on you. Fool me twice, shame on me. You know, don't, don't trust them ever again. And don't associate yourself with them and avoid them. Avoid them. And if they try to bait you into their poisonous politics um, by asking you certain questions or making certain comments, don't give them the satisfaction of answering with something they can repeat, right? You can basically say, I understand. I know it sounds elusive, but if you say, I understand, right? you're not saying I agree or disagree. You're just kind of saying, I understand, right? And they can't use that against you. So watch out for those people. There are sharks everywhere, I promise you every company you work in. And it sucks because I've worked at companies in the past where, and, and it's, I, I want to be humble, but I'm not right now when I say this. I've worked at companies in the past where I've been amazing at what I, what I do. I've been a team player, but because I've been so good, you know, people have felt threatened by me. You know, maybe my boss might have thought, goodness, I hired my assassin. If this person is so good at what he or she does, they might rise through the ranks. I'm going to make sure to keep them down in the ranks. And if you feel frustrated by that, that's a good thing because it will motivate you to get out and start your own company where you can create your own culture of collaboration and not have to deal with those jerks that are hyper competitive that backstab you. The bottom line is they will get found out eventually. Okay, If they're jerks to you, they're jerks to other people as well. And their career will not progress as quickly because of that. You'll see. You'll see. But a better course of action is for you to start your own company. You know, channel that frustration. Channel that frustration so you can have the freedom to be yourself and live your life on your terms by starting your own company. And you'll never be able to get away from corporate politics ever until you work for yourself. All right. Oh, you're welcome for that. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you. All right. So, looks like there's no more questions. Uh, I, I want to thank you all for your time. Um, if you subscribe to my vlog, I will see you manana on my daily vlog. Uh, if, if not, I will see you next week. Uh, this has been a, a very fun webcast. Uh, within 24 hours, we'll have the, the, the write-up all done. So, you can go to the description field. Regular will get it ready. So, you can click on any question in case you missed any questions. Uh, thanks again. Uh, God bless. Uh, and I will see you next week at the same time. Thank you.